Hello and a very warm welcome for this uh, neat PG recall MCQ discussion for community medicine. I'm Dr. Mohit Singh. Neat PG entrance exam. This is the same exam which had asked a question on bland Altman analysis and bland Altman analysis. Even I did not know while I was doing my post graduation PG in community medicine. And this is the same exam which has now asked you about questions on what is the route of administration of JE uh, vaccine or what are the contraindications of live virus vaccines. So this uh, neat entrance exam, uh, basically the examiners have showed you, have told you, they have uh, proved to you that they can ask the easiest question and they could be very difficult question. However, if as far as community medicine is concerned, there were many MCQs which were easy looking MCQs. They were actually not easy. They need, uh, they required some of the inner depth understanding and there were some very simple easy MCQs. So if you just analyze this whole MCQ exam, maximum questions were from nutrition topic this year. 2021. Next was many MCQs were there from environment and then you had questions from health planning which was again not conventional or not traditional way because so many questions on health planning uh, they've not seen in neat entrance exam till now. And then there were a couple of questions on vaccines, miscellaneous topics and communicable disease. If you look at the topics which were being asked in nutrition many MCQs were from malnutrition indicators vitamin deficiencies, neural atherism and staphylococcal food poisoning. So there were seven MCQs from nutrition alone, six MCQs from environment. And then you had these communicable disease, which are of course big overlap. Like you can have this question from chickenpox, right? Chickenpox in a female, in a mother. Uh, this question could be from pediatrics. It could be from obscine. It could be from microbiology. It could be from preventive medicine or PSM. You had that question on RTI, gonorrhea, that image based question, uh, measles virus, and then uh, use of rifampicin and OCP use from pharmacology. So you had many, many overlaps. Let's leave aside communicable disease. We'll talk of uh, pure hardcore MCQs from nutrition, from environment, from uh, health management, uh, many questions from vaccines and miscellaneous questions. So let's get on and take on the first topic that is an easy one that is what are the questions in vaccine. So question number one, there is an outbreak of acute encephalitis in the community and a vaccination drive is launched. Which of the following is true about the vaccine in this condition? So of course, I think we all know we are talking of the Japanese encephalitis virus vaccine. A few MCQs on this JE vaccine. What is the strain of the JE vaccine? It is SA1414-2. What is the route of administration? It is a subcutaneous vaccine. It is a subcutaneous vaccine. It is a live vaccine. Next is this SA141412 or the or the Japanese encephalitis virus vaccine. It has to be reconstituted. It has to be reconstituted with a phosphate buffer. With a phosphate buffer. And because it is reconstituted, it does not follow the open vial policy. It does not follow the open vial policy. What does that mean? That means that normally all the vaccines, they can be kept up till 28 days. But JE vaccines, once it is opened and reconstituted, it cannot be kept for 28 days. It has to be used within few hours, two to four hours. Or in the same day, it has to be used. So the maximum shelf life after reconstitution, after opening the vial, that is two to four hours, reconstitution with phosphate buffer. And these are some of the MCQs. Next is what is the schedule of the vaccine? The Japanese encephalitis vaccine is given in India in all the JE endemic districts. It is given at nine months of age. And then the second dose is given at 16 to 24 months of age, 16 to 24 months of age. So this is under the national immunization schedule. Can this vaccine be given to a child who is unimmunized for five years or three years or 10 years? Yes, answer is yes. This vaccine can be given up till age of 15 years, but with a gap of gap of at least three months with a gap of at least 12 weeks, three months between the first dose and the second dose. So these were some of the high yield important MCQs which can be asked on Japanese encephalitis virus vaccine. 
So now let us have a look at uh, some of the other vaccines for which you should be knowing, knowing the route of administration, the site of administration and what is the dose. So if you talk about the oral polio vaccine, the rotavirus vaccine and vitamin A, they are all oral administration. Oral polio vaccine, OPV vaccine is two drops. The rotavirus vaccine is given at the dose of 2.5 ml or it is given at the dose of 5 drops. So if it is with a dropper, it is 5 ml. If it is in a syringe kind of uh, thing for the Rotarix, then it is 2.5 ml. Vitamin A is given at the dose of 1 ml or 2 ml based on the age of the, of the child. The BCG vaccine, BCG vaccine is given in the dose of 0.1 ml. It is intradermal injection, but in case the BCG is supposed to be given to a child whose age is less than one month, in that case, we are giving half of the dose 0.05 ml. So 0.05 ml for child who is age less than one month or at birth if you are giving. And then you have the JE vaccine, which is a live vaccine. It is a subcutaneous vaccine given in the dose of 0.5 ml. The DPT booster or the pentavalent, both are given in the dose of 0.5 ml. The hepatitis B birth dose 0.5 ml. And then you have the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Again, intramuscular vaccine, it is given in the dose of 0.5 ml. Measles rubella vaccine or the measles vaccine, again, dose is 0.5 ml. IPV intradermal 0.1 ml. So intradermal vaccine, the dose is 0.1 ml. The intramuscular vaccine, the dose is 0.5 ml. The subcutaneous vaccine, again, the dose is 0.5 ml. Please remember that in the left upper arm, I would like to appreciate, I would like to point out over here that uh, uh, the vaccine which are given in the left upper arm, they both are not intramuscular. One is subcutaneous and one is BCG that is intradermal. Whereas on this arm, on the right upper arm, we are giving measles and IPV. IPV again is intradermal and the measles is subcutaneous. So on the both arms, it is subcutaneous and intradermal. On the thighs, it is anterolateral thigh. It is the intramuscular and oral is oral. So in that way, it would be kind of easy for you to remember in your exam. Let us take the next question. A girl child had recurrent yeast infections and the respiratory virus infections since she was three months of age. Which of the vaccine following vaccine is contraindicated considering her immune status? So probably this question is trying to point out that because of recurrent yeast infections or common respiratory virus infection, probably this patient is immunosuppressed. So in case there is immunosuppression or in case the patient or the child is immunocompromised, in those cases, I think we all know that the live vaccines are contraindicated. The live vaccines are contraindicated and out of all the options, the killed IPV, the killed IPV is not a live vaccine. The DPT, it is a mixed combined vaccine where the diphtheria and the tetanus, these are toxoids and produces uh, is the killed vaccine. TT or the TD, this is again tetanus toxoid with diphtheria component, which is a killed vaccine. So which of the following is the only one which is a live vaccine? That is a measles rubella vaccine. You can also remember all the live vaccines by this commonly um, uh, remembered mnemonic or commonly discussed mnemonic. That is a boy likes crime types. So boy, B stands for the BCG vaccine. O stands for the oral polio vaccine. Y stands for the yellow fever vaccine. Likes means the live viruses, live virus vaccines. C stands for chickenpox, chickenpox, R is for rubella vaccine, I is for influenza vaccine, influenza vaccine, M is for measles vaccine and then you have the E that is the encephalitis, the Japanese encephalitis vaccine. E stands for the Japanese encephalitis, the live virus vaccine. TYP, this is the, the oral typhi, oral typhi. 21A. Oral Typhi 21A, this is also a live vaccine. So you can remember this commonly uh, discussed mnemonic that is boy loves or boy likes the crime types. Next uh, question. In a 10 year old girl child, which of the following vaccine is given as a part of the immunization program? So again, this is pretty easy and pretty straightforward. So which of the following would be the best answer? BCG at 10 years of age. Do you think you would give BCG at 10 years of age? Answer is a big no. BCG is given till what time beta? 
BCG कब तक देते हैं BCG is given only till one year of age. So it's not that after one year of age, the if you're giving BCG, the child is going to explode or something. It's just that the national immunization schedule or the government of India they have they have categorized that this vaccine will be given till this year age group because of the public health importance of that uh, of the transmission of the disease uh, beyond a certain age is not required. So BCG is given till one year. MMR or the measles containing vaccine these are till five years. The TT vaccine they can be given all the time like even in uh, ten years and. 20 years it depends on the uh, age of the patient and of course based on the trauma also we are giving tt or the td vaccine then dpt is given maximum up till 7 years so what i have written over here is for the unimmunized child in a 10 year old school child as per the immunization schedule what is the vaccine which is due at that time it is the tetanus toxoid or the td vaccine if you look at the national immunization schedule which i think most of you must be already knowing so i would not be spending uh, a lot of time on this again but but just to reinforce the points that at birth what are the vaccines we are giving beta please remember please recall please say with me even if you know it there's no harm in saying or or just talking to the screen so please say with me at birth what are the vaccines we give we give bcg we give opv that is the zero dose and hepatitis b that is the birth dose mark the words it is opv zero dose hepatitis b birth dose it is not opv birth dose hmm? OPV zero dose and hepatitis B birth dose. We call this as a birth dose because it actually prevents the transmission of the virus from the mummy to the child. And uh, therefore, that's the reason that hepatitis B birth dose, it has to be given within 24 hours. Okay, OPV zero dose can be given till 15 years of age, uh, 15 days and BCG tell, can be given till one year of age. At 6, 10 and 14, we give oral polio vaccine, we give pentavalent vaccine, we give rotavirus vaccine, we give the injectable polio vaccine that is a fractional IPV and we give the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So PCV1 and PCV2, they are given at 6 weeks and 14 weeks. They are not given at the 10th week. The fractional IPV is given at 6 weeks and 14 weeks. They are not given at the 10 weeks. The rotavirus is given at 6, 10 and 14. Rota 1, Rota 2 and Rota 3. Penta 1, Penta 2, Penta 3. OPV 1, OPV 2 and OPV 3. At 9 months of age, we are giving the measles rubella 1. Plus, we are also giving the booster dose of the, of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, the PCV vaccine. Alongside, we are starting a new vaccine that is the Japanese encephalitis, the first dose. It has to be given at nine months of age in the uh, for the children who are living in the JE endemic districts. Then you have the vitamin A. At 16-24 months, a lot of booster doses will be given. 16-24 months, first you have the DPT booster, then you have the OPV booster, and then you have the measles second dose and the Japanese encephalitis second dose at 16-24 months. Please remember this. Five to six years of age, you have the DPT second booster. And then at 10, 16 years of age, you have the tetanus diphtheria vaccine instead of the tetanus toxoid, instead of TT. Now the government of India has replaced TT with TD vaccine. So I think you should be knowing this. You all must be very nicely remembering this. You all know this beta. Let's get on and take on the next MCQ. About the nutrition. A man from Chhattisgarh presented with muscle weakness point to be noted muscle weakness leg spasms pure motor weakness pure motor weakness what is the most appropriate history to be elicited in this patient so the mcq person has given you a big clue that this person belongs to chhattisgarh from Madhya, uh, nearby madhya pradesh area so beta in central india a lot of times we have this uh, motor neuron disease that is a degenerative disease, degenerative motor neuron disease that is called as neurolatherism. So technically, you are going to talk of the history of the diet. In all the MCQs, you must have noted, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you that in all the MCQs, you might be seeing a small footnote towards the left bottom corner of your screen. In the footnote, I have given you, if you're following the marrow lectures, what is the timeline and what is the lecture which you need to see for more information on the same topic? or for finding out what all other type of MCQs can be formed from the same topic. In case you are following my book, that is the Conceptual Review in PSM, Preventive and Social Medicine by CBS Publishers. Recently, we came out with the third edition. Now we are going to come out with the fourth edition. I have given you along with the page number, the topic which you should be reading because these are the frequently asked topics and there, there is a pattern that this uh, neat entrance exam might follow. 
So, better coming back to this MCQ, the person is from Chhattisgarh. It is uh, this person is presenting with a mere, pure motor weakness. So, you're technically thinking of maybe it is neural atherism. You're taking a history of their diet, like what is the type of food that this person was taking. A little bit, a uh, few points about neural atherism. The toxin name is BOA, that is beta, auxilyl, amino, halanin. The food product it affects is a kesari dal. It is a kesari dal. So, uh, kesari dal, in the scientific name, it is also called as lethyrus sativus. It is also called as lethyrus sativus. That's a food product. The boa toxin is there in the lethyrus sativus. So, mind it that uh, there is no food adulteration. It is the lethyrus sativus dal, that is the pulse, which itself is toxic. So overconsumption of the lethyrus sativus for maybe three to five months may cause accumulation of beta auxilyl amino alanine. And this boa toxin, beta auxilyl amino alanine, this is a mitochondrial toxin, mitochondrial toxin, and it causes cell death. Predominantly, it causes motor neuron cell death and degeneration degeneration so this will cause a lot of uh, paralysis and weakness and spastic paralysis of the leg muscles or the lower limbs so what are the signs and symptoms in this predominantly it is the see uh, it affects most of the of the joints it affects maximum the knee joint and the ankle joint and the ankle i'm sorry for my writing it it affects the ankle joint and the knee joint so knee joint is more affected than the ankle joint and which is more affected than the hip joint okay it is it is a disease of the joints but it is not an arthropathy it is a neurolatherism it is a cns abnormality it is a motor neuron disease motor neuron degenerative disease so what are the signs and symptoms of this uh, disease neural atherism you can see that in this image you can see that this child the child needs a stick to walk and can you appreciate that there is bending of the knee the knee is bent and there is inversion of the foot can you appreciate this there is inversion of the foot so there is inversion of the foot with the bending of the knee, this is what is a neural atherism. It is a disease of the joints with knee joint affecting, being affected more than the ankle joint. And this is the dal that you can see. This is the lethyrus sativus. Lethyrus sativus. So, in fact, there were a lot of uh, epidemics of uh, neural atherism in, in Africa, in Ethiopia, and the drugs, or the, this uh, pulse was banned in those areas because it had so much toxic effect on people and there were so many people who were being affected with neural atherism. In neural atherism, there are predominantly five stages which are not discrete. There is a lot of overlapping of these stages. In the latent stage, there is weakness of the lower limb weakness of the lower limb with spasticity spasticity of leg muscles with spasticity of the leg muscles there is a restriction of the movement there is pain and a restriction of knee joint ankle joint predominantly for pain and restriction then there is a no stick stage where there is aggravation of these symptoms and with the aggravation along with the aggravation that the person will have abnormal gait abnormal gait then there is one stick and two stick stages where there is more aggravation and at the last there is crawler stage there is very much increased amount of knee flexion knee flexion that the person cannot stand up and that's the reason uh, they cannot walk and they would be inability to walk also inability to stand also inability to stand and that's the reason they would not be able to walk also so these were uh, some of the uh, clinical features of neural atherism neural atherism if you see it is predominantly in uh, west bengal area then you have bihar uttar pradesh Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra and Chhattisgarh area. These are the areas which are uh, 
predominantly showing cases of neurolatherism, right? So last is about the prevention. How do you prevent neurolatherism? It is prevented by consumption of vitamin C. Vitamin C somehow it acts as a detoxifiant for the beta oxalyl amino alanine. Just a small point over here, if you look at the global chart, there are two diseases which are there. That is the neurolatherism and there is a conzo disease. I'm not trying to teach you a new disease over here. It is not at all required for your MCQ exam, but just an interesting fact over here that the conzo disease is predominantly in Africa, whereas neurolatherism is in many parts of the globe, including India. There is a, there is a very a remarkable feature over here that the conzo and the neurolatherism, they do not overlap. They both are uh, closely related. There is spastic paralysis. There is knee involvement, there is ankle involvement, but categorically the neurolatherism, it is due to boa toxin, whereas the conzo disease, which is predominantly in Africa, it is due to uh, uh, ingestion of the cassava roots, cassava roots, which may have cyanide. So cyanide again causes spastic paralysis, boa also causes spastic paralysis, of course, with different mechanism. Right. So if you look at the conzo disease, it is almost very, very, very much similar to the neurolatherism. Again, there is involvement of the knee. You can you can see here involvement of the knee, but the ankle is also involved where there is almost equal kind of involvement of the ankle and the person has to walk on toes. The person has to walk on toes. So it is by ingestion of the cassava roots and uh, that is what is the about the neurolatherism and the conzo disease. Just a small information for you. So however, this MCQ was pretty easy. Person from Chhattisgarh with the with the muscle weakness and leg spasms and pure motor weakness answer should be you're talking of probably you're talking of uh, neurolatherism and you should be talking about the history of the diet of the person. So now let us move to the next MCQ. An Anganwadi worker takes the weight and height of a four year old child and finds the height for age less than minus two standard deviation. Hana? Less than minus two standard deviation. The likely cause is acute, chronic, recent or whatever. So beta, if you are on marrow platform, please watch the module number 68. If you are talking about my book, that is the conceptual review in PSM, Preventive and Social Medicine, please uh, look at the page number 808 in the third edition. We have discussed in depth about malnutrition, what are the indicators and how to go about in assessment of malnutrition. This is a very frequently asked topic and it is a seven star topic for your MCQ exams for your entrance exam. So technically speaking, there are three indicators in undernutrition or malnutrition. There is a weight for age, there is a weight for height and a height for age. But if you see that they, if you talk about a person who's having undernutrition who's got diarrhea or whatever so what will happen to the weight the wasn the person's weight for the particular age if a person has got three days of diarrhea or whatever acute malnutrition in case of acute diarrhea what is going to happen to the weight the weight is going to decrease within three four days people will lose weight what is going to happen for the height height of that person for the age in three, four days disease, the height is not going to change. What is going to happen for the weight for that person height? Height will be same. The weight is going to decrease. So what will happen to the weight for the height? The weight for the height is going to decrease. Let us now talk about chronic malnutrition. Let us now talk about chronic malnutrition. Person who's got Whipple's disease, malabsorption syndrome since long. So what will happen to the weight of that baby for that age? The weight is going to decrease for that particular age. What is going to happen to the height for the age also? To the height for the age. What do you think is going to happen for the height for the age? The height of the person is going to decrease for that particular age because that person is going, the child is already having a lot of undernutrition or malnutrition. The height for age is going to be low. What is going to happen for the weight for that height? The height is low, the weight is also low. So that may look normal to you. Are you getting it? So therefore, if you talk about the indicators of undernutrition, which is a general indicator of undernutrition, the general indicator of undernutrition is weight for age. It is very commonly used in growth charts also. We normally plot the weight for the age in the growth charts. If you talk about this indicator weight for height, weight for height is very good indicator for acute malnutrition. 
it is a good indicator for acute malnutrition and on the other hand if you talk for height for the age it is a very good indicator for chronic malnutrition the height for the age are you getting it so that's what this question had asked that the person is having a height for age less than two standard deviation so if you have got height for the age height for age less than minus two standard deviation this is called as stunting and it is seen in chronic malnutrition it is called as it is seen in chronic malnutrition are we getting it so what is the answer over here you're going to mark the option you already must have marked this is a direct mcq easy mcq the answer would have been chronic malnutrition let us move on to the next topic a 16 month old child with 8 kilograms of weight a 16 month old child with 8 kilograms of weight on assessment on a growth chart the child falls below minus 2 between minus 2 and minus 3 st what should be done for the management of the child in this mcq there have been different opinions from different students i would duly respect your opinion so some students have told that this was the chart some have told that maybe pink color was the chart some have told maybe blue color was the chart so we don't remember whether it was pink color blue color or this color we don't know that irrespective of the point that i'm not trying to replicate the mcqs over here i'm just trying to discuss the mcq so that beta if you know then only you will be able to solve it so i don't know what the mcq was i absolutely don't know how the graph was because you have confused me also and there are so many answers we duly respect your uh, opinions right so uh, so beta in this you just have to see that where the person was lying so you see the age of the baby you see the age of the baby and you see the weight of the baby simple you find out where that person was lying what is the point of the coordinate if the person is lying i'll just take a new scale a new sheet over here if the person was lying this is zero this is 50th percentile then there is minus two standard deviation then there is minus three standard deviation right then there is plus and all that right forget about the plus things if a child is mark the words if a child is between 50th percentile that is the median that is also called as the zero standard deviation over here this is known as a green zone and the child is okay there is no malnutrition no undernutrition okay if the child is following falling between minus 2 and minus 3 so if the child is below the cutoff limit of minus 2 if you have attended my biostats lecture you already know the importance of plus minus 2 standard deviation that is the zone of normalcy yeah. so in that zone of normalcy if the child is lying that is we consider that there is no undernutrition now if the child is below the zone of normalcy that is less than minus 2 standard deviation in those cases we will say that the child is having moderately the child is moderately undernourished undernourished so the child is moderately undernourished we don't have anything called as a mild undernourishment or a mild malnutrition there is no mild malnutrition there is only moderate undernourishment or moderate malnutrition below the minus 3 standard deviation below the minus 3 standard deviation there is severe undernourishment or severe malnutrition this child is called as a severe acute malnourishment or sam child if it is below minus 3 if you all have attended my biostats lecture i already told you that this is what is a normal distribution curve you can see that this is the median then there is minus 1 then there is minus 2 and then there is minus 3 if you just take this growth chart over here if you just take this growth chart can i say that this is somewhat is the this is let us say that this is the line and then there is this is the normal distribution so you have median minus 2 sd minus 3 sd any child who is below minus 3 sd will be severe malnutrition any child who is between minus 2 and minus 3 this is known as a moderately undernourished child and then you have the green zone are you understanding this it is very similar to the biostats thing so i don't know why you're getting confused but please remember if that per, if that dot which you had seen now this dot you have to find it in your exam right so if there is weight on this axis 
and there is age on this axis, then you need to find out where that actually dot is, where that intersection point is, where the coordinates meet. Once you find out that where the coordinates meet and then you find out where there is moderate undernourishment or there is severe acute malnourishment. Are we getting it? There is a separate ICDS chart for boys. This chart is from birth till five years. It is for boys. This is a blue color chart. And then there is a pink color chart, which is for girls. And there is again from birth till five years. And this is as per the WHO standard. This is what is the ICDS growth chart. If you look over here, I don't know how many of you can see it. I want to zoom it and show it to you. So once I zoom it and show it to you, I know that this image might be blurred for you. But I just want to tell you that if you can see that what is written here. Can you read it? It is a moderate undernourishment, moderately underweight baby, which is between minus two and minus three SD. And then severe undernourishment or severe malnourishment, which is below minus 3 ST. There is nothing called as a mild under, undernourishment. We have a normal zone, then we have moderate, and then we have a severe undernourishment. So based on this, you need to classify. Simple. I don't think this was a big, huge task. So coordinates beta, you need to find out. Wherever the baby was, you have to mark that. In case the baby is in the normal zone, then there is a reassurance. If that was in the option, then you should mark a reassurance. Now, in case many of you have told me that it was between minus two and minus three. So we respect that. So in that case, you have to have moderate malnutrition and tell the mother how to feed moderate malnutrition and you send back the female home with a reassurance that is absurd answer. So moderate, even many students have told that maybe that was there in the option. I'm not sure. But if that was the option, again, you do not mark that. Moderate malnourishment, the ASHA worker, the Anganwadi worker, the ANM, the nurses, they all have to tell the female of how to improve the feeding of the baby. So they have to teach how to feed. In case it was a severe undernourishment, if the child was, a, if that coordinates, your coordinates were falling below minus 3 SD. Now, in that case, it is a severe malnourishment. You have to refer to the NRC. Advise the mother with calorie output is again, with calorie inputs is again a wrong answer. In case of severe acute malnourishment, we have to refer to the NRC. What is NRC, beta? NRC is Nutritional Rehabilitation Centers. We have had a lot of video modules on this. We have a lot of lectures on this. We have a lot of uh, study material in my book. Also, I've written a lot of things about the Nutritional Rehabilitation Centers, how these things work in our country. So, you need to read that but all said and done at least you should be knowing how to plot a growth chart i don't think there is a point of you to get confused on this anyways i think this was an easy mcq you should be knowing beta there is a normal zone yellow zone red zone normal is what is a green zone yellow is what is an undernourishment that is a mild to moderate we always say it is mild to moderate but in technical words in your mcq exam words it is a moderate undernourishment and then you have a severe undernourishment next mcq a 45 year old person presents with the following. So, uh, so I'll just go back to the previous MCQ. What was the answer over here? If you're taking the best answer, if you're taking the best answer as uh, the option as minus two, the coordinates were lying between minus two SD and the minus three SD. Your best answer would be moderate malnutrition and teach the mother how to feed. This is your best answer option number B. So now coming to the next MCQ, a 45 year old male presents to you with the following skin changes. What history are you going to diagnose this condition? So actually this is the start of the, of the integration module of the preparation of the NB for the next exam. So in this, you have, they have tried to make this as two step type of MCQs where you have to understand a situation, make a diagnosis and then answer the MCQ, right? So the question is telling you that there is a following skin changes. You can see that on the skin, on the, on the neck, there is kind of exfoliative dermatitis on the sun exposed area. And what history are you going to t talk on this condition? So probably this question is talking about a niacin deficiency about pellagra. So if you talk about pellagra, pellagra, it is because of niacin deficiency. Why do people get niacin deficiency? People get niacin deficiency, which is low in tryptophan, tryptophan, and which could be high in leucine. 
So leucine is also pellagrogenic and low tryptophan of course will not make niacin which is again causing pellagra. Pellagra you are going to have the classical three or four D's that is diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia and probably death in case it was it is untreated and there is no replacement for niacin so this is what is uh, the things you need to remember about uh, pellagra and niacin what is the recommended dietary allowance niacin is what vitamin beta it is vitamin b3 i think we all know that what is the recommended dietary allowance for uh, niacin the recommended dietary allowance for niacin is ranging from 10 to 20 milligram per day per day so depending whether it is a male worker or a female worker mild uh, light worker moderate worker heavy worker or it is a child so 10 to 20 milligram per day is what is the average rda for niacin and in these cases in case of niacin deficiency or predominant maize eaters uh, they they might land up into niacin deficiency the classical features are diarrhea dermatitis dementia and death and therefore that's the reason you need to talk about the three d's in pellagra i think this was a fairly straightforward easy mcq coming to the next topic a farmer is having a skin rash which increases with sun exposure again a photosensitivity rash it is associated with the redness of tongue which also might occur in riboflavin a deficiency it may also occur in many of the vitamin deficiency it is kind of a non-specific feature glossitis right so his staple diet is maize that's what is the catch point which of the following vitamin deficiency can probably the person be exposed to so technically we have just now discussed this this is what is a niacin deficiency so you have exfoliative dermatitis on the sun exposed areas there is history of dementia and there is history of diarrhea also and there could be death if this case was untreated coming to the next mcq which of the following is a conditioning influence for malnutrition i duly agree that this was a kind of a novel or a new topic for uh, uh, an entrance exam level exam so this is uh, conditioning influences for malnutrition where we talk about the ecosystems of malnutrition that why malnutrition actually happens it is actually a, a question a long note which we give to our UG students so over here which of the following is a conditional influence of uh, malnutrition it's a direct question from the ecology of uh, malnutrition they have taken from part textbook so what are the conditioning influences please note that the conditioning influences are essentially the malnutrition is due to infection. Infection causes malnutrition. Malnutrition causes more infection. Infection causes malnutrition. So this becomes a vicious cycle. Malnutrition causes infections and infection in turn causes more malnutrition. So infection is one of the main key conditioning uh, uh, factors in causing in leading to uh, malnutrition as a public health problem in our country so infectious diseases you would like to mark over here talking about the ecology or the ecosystem of the malnutrition why actually it happens it is because of some of the conditioning influences which we have already discussed infections why do infections happen because of poor environmental sanitation so all are interlinked over here right next is cultural influences that is what confused many of the students in fact i was also kind of confused over here why not to answer food habits or or the dietary habits they come under the cultural influences some religions are there which have certain kind of food predilections there are some traditions in villages by the way they are cooking foods or by the way they are eating food then there are socio-economic factors then there is food production of the country, health and services like nutrition surveillance, surveillances, the supplementary uh, supplementary food programs in schools or for, for disabilities or for people with disabilities or people who are homeless. Then there is health education system. So this is what is the ecology of malnutrition. These are the causes of malnutrition or the factors predisposing to malnutrition. Out of them, the conditioning influences. This is what is essentially, which was asked in the exam. This is what is the infections. So what is the best answer you would like to mark over here? The conditioning influence beta. Conditioning influences infectious for the first time like the NEAT PG they have asked this novel topic over here and uh, predominantly this was main topic in your UG exams. But anyways this is what is probably the preparation for the next exam. 
Coming to the next MCQ, a few persons out of 20 people group. So there was a group of 20 people out of which I think two people or 10 people, I don't know the number because many students gave me different answers, had pastries after the dinner last night, which are the fall, which was followed by bouts of vomiting. That is what is important that the bout of monit, um, vomiting early morning, the most probable causes, whether it will be bacillus serious or staph aureus or clostridia botulinum or the salmonella infection. So what actually it is, you can just have a look at this table. It's a very interesting table and very commonly asked table. So in case it is a salmonella food poisoning, it usually happens after 12 hours, but usually within 24 hours. And the feature in salmonella is a profuse watery diarrhea, which was not the case over here. So beta salmonella is out. Salmonella is a false option because it should be associated with diarrhea, profuse diarrhea. Next is, if you're talking of the botulinum toxin the botulinum toxin in botulinum toxin there are more important extra gastrointestinal manifestations like dysphagia there could be diplopia there could be dysarthria there could be blurring of vision muscle weakness these are the predominant features in botulinum toxin which again happens usually after 18 to 30 between 18 to 36 hours Next is, so botulism toxin is also out of the question because there was no other extra gastrointestinal manifestation. Next is talking about the bacillus serious and the staph aureus. If you talk about the bacillus serious, the typical MCQ will give you that there was a history of a rice, cooked rice, or there was a history of the processed food or raw food was taken. Raw processed food or there was history of cooked rice which was left outside and it was taken Chinese food or some fried rice something like this they'll give you the history and there are two types of uh, bacillus serious uh, infections we can have the predominantly emetic form or we can have the predominantly diarrheal form so a very close differential will happen with the predominantly em emetic form for bacillus serious over here and between the staph aureus in staph aureus in staph aureus it can happen as early as within 30 minutes to one hour till eight hours so one thing is for sure that this is a very short acting so you have the meal in the night and the next day early morning you start vomiting that is predominantly typical of the staph aureus poisoning so in staph aureus poisoning, very typically you have vomiting and cramping as the main feature. Diarrhea may or may not be associated. It is again with the preformed toxin of the staph aureus intradietetic uh, toxin. And in bacillus serious in the emetic form, again, it is within one to six hours, very close differential. But the type of food that you're eating, that is going to make the difference. So in bacillus serious, they'll tell you history about the uncooked rice or partially cooked rice, or there was cooked rice, which was left outside. And in staph Aureus, they'll give you some creamy thing, some salad thing, some milk or milk products. So over here, they are taken pastries. It's a very important indicator that probably you're dealing with a staph aureus infection, which is of course the best answer over here. Again, this question was kind of pretty uh, straightforward over here. And I think many of you must have done it right. So coming to the next topic, that is environment. A few questions were asked on environment. I think around five or six MCQs. Let us discuss them. First MCQ or in the chapter of environment, which of the following thermometer is used to measure the low air velocity, low air velocity rather than the cooling power of air. Now that kind of thing uh, like doses your head off. You already have learned in your lectures that cooling power of air is what is a kata thermometer. Right? You already know this, that cooling power of air is a kata thermometer. Right? We already know this. Now, this question is saying that tell me an instrument which is measuring low air velocity rather than cooling power of air. That means it measures cooling power of air and also measures the low air velocity. Are you getting this MCQ? So that means you need to think of a device which is measuring the low air velocity and probably the cooling power of air, but not so much about the cooling power of air. So that's what this question wanted to tell you or hint you. Answer is not a globe thermometer because you already know it is used for radiant heat. Answer is not a wet globe thermometer even. Answer is not dial thermometer because that is what is a conventional. So in fact, directly speaking, the answer was in front of your eyes, kata thermometer. There's no confusion in that. There is a wet kata thermometer and there is a dry kata thermometer. In the wet kata thermometer, there is a cloth piece hanging at the end and there is a cloth like to cover the bulb. 
So in the wet kata, you just dip the cloth in, in, in water and you let it hang. So in areas with low air movement or low air velocity, the wet kata is going to stay wet for a longer period of time. And the temperature is not going to like rise in that area. It is going to stay at a lower temperature only because of the evaporation thing. Right. So technically you can measure the air movement in the area by the degree of, uh, of drying of the by the degree of speed at which the cloth is drying. If you measure that, that is going to tell you about the air movement in a room. So you can compare low air movements in these rooms by the degree of the drying of the wet kata. So nowadays, many researchers, many institutes, they are using wet kata thermometer to measure the low air velocity or to measure the rate of change of air movement or the rate of change of, of drying of that cloth in a kata thermometer and it tells you about the low air velocity alongside it also tells you about the cooling path that is what the kata thermometer was meant to do so you cannot say that that the kata is not measured used to measure the cooling power it is used to measure the cooling power but it is nowadays also used to measure the low air velocity which is one of a definite good use of kata thermometer so the answer is pretty straightforward the answer is kata thermometer Next is which of the following is the SI unit for measurement of, mind the words, measurement of brightness of light from a point source. That is what the whole game was. It looks so easy. This question was brightness. So everybody must be answering Lux or the Lamberts or this many lumens. But the answer is beta that from the point source, from the source, from the point, how much light is being started. That is brightness of light is measured in the units called as candela. We have discussed this so many times. This is what is the luminous intensity. The luminous intensity, the intensity of the light at which it is being born, the brightness of the light from the power source, that is the candela. And then there is a flow of light, that is the lumens. And then there is amount of light which reaches a surface. This pen, how much light is reaching? This is what is lux. And then there is amount of light which is re-emitted, that is what is Lambert. So I think I have taught you many times in your video lectures also, in your classes also, that that's how the light is being assessed from the point, the flow, the reaching, the re-emergence. So you have the candela, the lumens, the lux, and then the Lambert, right? So the, what is the best answer over here? The best answer over here is candela. You need to remember this, you need to cram this by heart. So it was a direct easy looking MCQ. Next MCQ. A child presented with this, I'm not going to talk to you again if you do this wrong in your exam. A child presented with pharyngitis and a throat swab was obtained and sent for culture. So it's a throat swab sent for culture. The swab should be discarded in which color bin? Why on earth do you get confused all the time? With such easy MCQs, there is no point in uh, getting scared because of the fact that I, I've seen many students who got scared from biomedical waste. And uh, it's like you get scared and there is more chance of you to do the mistake because you're so much scared. Don't get scared of biomedical waste. It is such an easy topic. So the throat swab, a swab was obtained and sent for culture. What's, what is the area you're going to discard? And it is no, nowhere it is mentioned that it has to be plastic. It has to be metal. It has to be something. We don't know that. So all the laboratory waste, biotechnology waste, that is what category? That is yellow H. This is the same slide I have taken from the video lectures. The yellow H category is microbiology, biotechnology lab waste or other clinical laboratory waste, waste blood bags containing contaminated blood, laboratory cultures, stocks, human cell cultures used in research, production of biological residual toxin dishes and devices used for cultures. Everything is yellow H category. So yellow H category is what is, just remember this chart, this is a pretty easy and a straightforward and all time you're going to get question on this. Yellow H category is microbiological or biotechnology waste and we are supposed to pre-treat that particular waste and then send it for incineration to the common biomedical waste treatment facility. So uh, many students got confused with the red category. In red category, there is plastic and people thought that because the core, uh, the swab could be plastic, so why not to throw it in the red category? Please note that in red category, they have categorized what all things have to be given, what all things have to be disposed of under the red category. You have the tubes, 
<clears throat> the bottles, the saline bottles, the IV tubes and sets, the catheters and the urine bags, the syringes without needles, and vacutainers and all types of gloves, waste pipette, plastic pipette, rubber teats, drains, oxygen mask. Very important. This can be your next MCQ because oxygen masks, they have been so much in, in enormous amounts we have used in our country. Thick plastic splash proof gowns, rubber apron, ELISA and plastic vials and vacutainers not containing blood samples. Please note that they do not contain blood samples. This is what is a red category right so please note that these the what is the best answer over here the child presented with pharyngitis a throat swab was taken what is the best answer you're going to dispose of the things in the yellow category please note it my request to you do not do these type of uh, blunders in case you have marked a red category or a blue or a white category next is air pollution index chart of four consecutive days from Delhi station is given below. Uh, the air quality index on November 23rd in Delhi is classified as. So you can see that on 23rd November, the maximum air quality index was there. So what is it? So I think from common sense, you can say that whether it is a poor, a very poor, moderate or severe. So what do you think? It is considered as a severe air quality index so you have this categorization there's the same chart i think we had used in my video lectures also so you more than 400 to 500 we categorize it as severe air quality less than 50 is taken as a good air quality that is what you need to remember for your exam so you can watch for more information on air quality indices in video number 81 and from my uh, book uh, crpsm at page number 276 Coming to the next MCQ, following admission of an uh, of a RTA road traffic accident case, there is spillage of blood on the hospital floor, which disinfectant you are going to use. So please note that uh, we have discussed this again. The disinfectant that you are going to use in case of blood spills is not chlorhexidine, it is not alcohol, it is sodium hypochlorite. The best answer over here is sodium hypochlorite in case of spillage. The first thing is we have to cordon off the area. You have to secure the area. Next is you wear the gloves. Third is you put any old tissue paper or you put some blotting paper or you put some absorbent onto the spill and directly discard it in which category? It is discarded in the yellow category. Once you have put uh, that uh, blotting paper or the newspapers and taken the main things and discarded in the yellow category, now you over that spill area, you have to pour disinfectant. You have to pour sodium hypochlorite. It is a chlorine based disinfectant and you let it be there, the sodium hypochlorite for 20, 30 minutes, approximately half an hour. And then again, you take towels or blotting paper or cloth or newspaper and again, you wipe it off. Again, you take and, and uh, discard it in the yellow category and then you need to remove your gloves and decontaminate the area and then you are free to go. So that is a basic uh, way to do spill management and about the spill uh, in case of spill, what is the disinfectant you're going to use? You're going to use the sodium hypochlorite solution. Talking about the next MCQ, there is an outbreak of buboes in the community. So there is a bubonic plague over here. There is an outbreak of bubonic plague. So you're talking of the bubonic plague. Bubonic plague. You're talking of the bubonic plague. There is an outbreak of this condition. What is the vector which is responsible for this condition? What do you think? Is it the Xenopsial Achiopis, the Phlebotomus Argentipis, Exodus tick or the female Anopheles mosquito? You can see that uh, so many ticks and infects and insects are there. So what is this? Can you recognize this? What insect is this? This is what? Zoom into your screen. Let us see it. Mark it, please write it in the in the comment box wherever you can. This is a sand fly. This is a sand fly. What is this? This is a phlebotomus argentipis. Phlebotomus argentipis is a sand fly. Sand fly is responsible for causing which disease? It is responsible for causing Kala Azar, the oriental sore. It is for visceral leishmaniasis, the Kala Azar. Next, what do you see over here? What type of uh, thing it is? It is called as a rat flea. Rat flea. Please note that rat flea will not have wings. It is a flea, but it does not have wings. 
and it has six long legs. It is a flattened insect. Rat flea causes plague. And rat flea is what is Xenopsiella chiopis. Xenopsiella chiopis. This is what is a rat flea and this is what is the main organism which causes bubos or the bubonic plague. What is this over here? You can see that there is a head and there are four pairs of leg. This is a tick. It is a hard tick. It is a hard tick or the exodus tick. Exodus tick is uh, transmitting which disease? It is for Lyme disease. Exodus tick is for Lyme disease. And then you have your pretty looking mosquito, the Anopheles mosquito. Anopheles mosquito causes what disease? It causes malaria. Anopheles co mosquito causes malaria. Please note it. Anopheles causes malaria. Culex will cause Japanese encephalitis. Aedes will cause Aedes will cause dengue fever. Mansonia mosquito is uh, implicated in causing lymphatic filariasis along with Culex. Culex also causes lymphatic filariasis and Mansonia will also cause lymphatic filariasis. Moving to the next topic, the health planning and management. The Pathanam Thitta district of Kerala was affected by floods was affected by floods and the government of uh, Kerala distributed doxycycline tablets for profile access. Which other chemical may be preferred to be distributed along with it? Hmm? I do not know the language of the MCQ. I do not know the, the preferred way in which this MCQ was asked. We all know that these were the options for sure. So there was a particular district, Pathanam Thitta district in Kerala, which had floods. So after floods, what do you think? What does your mind say? After floods, what does your mind say could be the diseases in that area? The first thing that we have to prevent beta is what is acute gastroenteritis. Because diarrheal outbreaks or the gastroenteritis outbreak is the most common outbreaks after flood. It could be you're talking of Kerala or Jammu Kashmir or Uttarakhand. You're talking of any area in the world. After floods, it has to be diarrheal disease. Next in line, you have the vector borne diseases. Vector borne diseases like predominantly malaria. It could also be dengue. Because of a lot of artificial containing water, because of a lot of uh, clean stagnant water in the area malaria could be there dengue could be there in very few areas you can also have outbreaks of uh, maybe japanese encephalitis or lymphatic filariasis but that is all pretty rare they happen in uh, with culex and mansonia mosquitoes which are more ardent they are very rigid mosquitoes and they live in their fixed places Mens uh, the anopheles and the dengue with the aedes mosquito they can happen and they uh, they rapidly multiply and they have the epidemic potential so you're bothered about the vector borne disease you also are bothered about the leptospirosis which was in fact the government of Kerala they had seen the increase in number of cases after after floods and way back in 2018 I think so this question pertains to that time I talked to many faculties I talked to senior people in Kerala about what happened so uh, and common sense also tells you the disaster plan also tells you that after floods you have to distribute chlorine tablets so one thing is for sure that in the government of Kerala they must have in government of Kerala, they must have distributed doxycycline plus they must have distributed chlorine tablets, chlorine tablets plus they have distributed bleaching powder, bleaching powder. This is one of the main stay for distribution to the community. Done with this. Now comes these options. Now comes whether will you distribute zinc phosphide, malathion, linden, or Paris green. See, try understand. Uh, try to understand that government of India is not going to distribute the insecticides to people homes. If you distribute insecticides to people to the community, what if the community if someone uh, takes all the toxic dose and dies? Who's going to be responsible? The government is not going to take the blame of that. Or in other words, let us say that you're distributing malathion or zinc phosphide to people and uh, the, still you get outbreak of disease. The government won't say that I gave you malathion, it's your wish now. It doesn't happen like that, beta. You have to understand that probably what I think the language of the MCQ would have been that what other chemical was preferred to be distributed to the health officials so that they can disseminate that. So the answer to this, according to me, is malathion. 
according to my understanding is malathion i could be grossly wrong but what i understand from this mcq from the from the common sense knowledge and from what my colleagues in kerala have told me the they had given all the all the chlorine tablets with doxycycline and bleaching powder and there was intense fogging using malathion and cyfluthin in, in that area to prevent any vector borne disease program uh, prevent any vector borne disease outbreak over there so uh, uh, then later on i also found out this uh, link the link will also be given to you it will be shared it may be shared in the description box also otherwise you can just google it so this is uh, the link is uh, regarding the center monitoring surveillance data for potential outbreak of disease in kerala way back in uh, uh, 2018 and august 30th so the the news itself says that the rising trend of in the cases of leptospirosis was there but then they had distributed emergency drug bleaching powder sanitary pads and napkins with siphenothrin di flu benzuron and malathion was distributed was given in excess to the health officials so that they can disseminate to the public not in terms of like you take 500 ml of malathion you take one liter of malathion not like this it is given to the health department so that they can do the fogging in excess in every year i was working in malaria department around three four years back i worked in malaria department for around five six years so i know in depth about it that how the system works every district has a limited quantity of of the insecticide which is coming from the center so in in certain conditions when there are floods or when there are heavy rainfall you need to ask the center to give them more malathion or insecticides so that is what the question was probably what other insecticide would you be asking to the center like in excess the answer should be malathion why is it not zinc phosphide zinc phosphide is a is a rodenticide it is very toxic to human if a thing can kill a rat it can kill a small baby also so zinc phosphide is highly toxic it is it cannot be I, uh, to my understanding it cannot be given paris green is again highly toxic it is in fact used in fireworks it is uh, it is not it is used it was used for control of mosquito larvas also but it cannot be used as general distributions linden of course is expensive it cannot be done the best answer over here is malathion i think so i'm i'm 99 sure on this after the floods the government has to focus on mitigation they have to focus on prevention of epidemic of diseases which may occur after floods i have already talked to you that there could be increase in number of cases of uh, vector borne disease gastroenteritis and leptospirosis so the best answer over here which i think is malathion so this is again a easy looking mcq which may require some depth understanding and this is what is the pattern for the next exam this is what is an integrated question and this is what is a clinical question in community medicine next question the school health programs are managed by the school health programs are managed by whom by the primary health center by the district hospital by the sub center by the sub divisional hospital of course that is not a sub divisional hospital it is not a district hospital because in the district there are so many schools the district hospital will not be able to manage it the best answer could be sub center or it could be a phc in sub center who is there it is the lady health worker or it is the anm multi purpose worker male female so they are not responsible for managing a school health system who is responsible for a school health system is a direct answer i don't think you should get confused on this if you have understood my lectures on health planning and management i have discussed over there that the medical officer plays very good amount of role where the medical officer is also responsible for screening of the children for vision disorders for vitamin a deficiencies they are responsible for dental caries checkup dental checkup for general checkup for for the children under the school health program is done by the medical officers medical officer in charge is responsible for uh, uh, running the school health program so the best answer over here is a phc of course in park textbook 636 page 25th edition directly they have taken this question the primary health centers are charged with the responsibility of administrating the school health services which we have already discussed many of times in our classes as well that how the health system in india works i think this was undoubtedly a very simple mcq but again easy looking mcq next mcq which of the following is not a component of global hunger index so global hunger index global hunger index you already know of hdi human development index you already know of multidimensional 
human poverty index you already know of pqli the global hunger index i had shared about the information about global hung hunger index on february 6 this year 2021 in your group in the marolinx group so the global hunger index was updated in year 2021 the data was there in 2020 and can you imagine it was asked in your exam that's how the community medicine works and that is the reason that i keep on shooting every update to you in your group i try to do that on any platform because these are the questions which will be uh, rank deciding questions because these are so many new updates so anyways even in my classes also in the live class and the lectures we have discussed this global hunger index many times global hunger index takes into account three things it takes into account child mortality it takes into account child undernutrition which includes both the wasting and it also includes the stunting and then you have undernourishment or inadequate food supply so from the government there is inadequate food supply then there is undernutrition and then there is child mortality child mortality is under 5 mortality child mortality is under 5 mortality so they, you are talking of undernourishment under 5 under mortality under 5 mortality and underweight and you just divide it by 3 so that will give you an average of that this is the global hunger index this is what is the global hunger index and uh, please mind it it does not include the infant mortality rate it does not include the infant mortality rate. It takes into account the percentage of undernourished. It takes into account the undernourished population and under five mortality rate. It does not take into account the infant mortality rate. Moving to the next MCQ, the evaluation based on treatment and clinical management of a patient in a healthcare facility. It measures what? The outcome. It measures the process. It measures the structure. It measures the input. There are two ways to solve this MCQ. If you had given uh, any time the USMLE steps or you know something about the PLAB exam, the MRCP exam, where they are going to evaluate the process. What do you mean by the process? The process means the way that which we diagnose the case. And once we diagnose the case, the way that which we are going to give the preventive therapy, the curative therapy or the treatment or the clinical management of that patient, uh, on what basis are we going to do that? What's our thinking process? So this all comes under the process evaluation, right? So uh, that is just one crude way that even if you didn't know anything, if you did not understand anything, still you would answer that probably the process would be the best answer over here. But talking about technical aspect over here, what are the steps of evaluation? The evaluation beta, the, the evaluation, it needs four or five things to be done. First is you should know what is to be evaluated. Next is what are the standards of evaluation? Then you do the method of evaluation. You gather information, you analyze, and then you keep on evaluating all the time. So very important is what is to be evaluated. Then you find out what are the standards, and then you do the method of evaluation, gather information, and so on. So what is to be evaluated? You can evaluate three things. You can either evaluate the structure, you can evaluate the process, or you can evaluate the outcome. If you evaluate the structure, that means what is the manpower which is there in, an, in a program. Let us take RNTCP. Let us take vector bond program. Let us take blindness control program. You evaluate the structure. You find out how many ophthalmologists are working. You find out how many district malaria control officers are working. You find out how many maybe the vector bond cells are there which are working. You find out how many iodine deficiency disorder control cells are there. So you see the manpower. You see how many units are there. What is the infrastructure? Do they have infrastructure? Do they have how many LED microscopes are there in NTEP, National TB Elimination Program? How many CBNAT machines are there? These are all structure evaluation. Then you do the process evaluation. What is process evaluation? You find out how the manpower, the doctor, how they are diagnosing the disease, how they are treating the disease, how they are offering the preventive services to the disease, to the people, not disease, to the people. How they are doing the clinical management of the case. How they are doing the clinical management of the case. All pretty important and wonderful things. That is how you do the evaluation of a process. And then you do the evaluation of outcome. Yeah? That what is the outcome? So outcome can be evaluated based on these four or five Ds. 
you can evaluate based on the disease how much prevalence of the disease increase decrease discomfort level in people or in patient increase decrease the disability indices or the disability indicators the dissatisfaction indicators like you visit a hospital how many people are satisfied how many are dissatisfied that is the outcome component then there is how many people died how many people survived you can check this also so all these are outcome indicators so outcome indicators would be based on the four or five d's that we have just now discussed the disease the disability the discomfort the death and so on dissatisfaction and so on the process indicators would be like diagnosing and treating and pre offering preventive services the elements of evaluation that is separate so first thing is you have to do what is to be evaluated then you find out the standard Standards, methodology, gather information and reevaluate. No MCQs on that, but that's what is a, a rough idea about the steps in evaluation. Then there is something called as elements of evaluation. So whenever you are defining the standards, just now we discussed about the criteria and the standards, right? We are discussing about the standards of the criteria. So there has to be some elements like the whatever evaluation you're doing or the criteria or the standard you put, that should be relevant. It should be adequate, accessible, acceptable by the people. Effectiveness should be there, efficiency and impact should be there. So whatever evaluation you are doing, these are the most important things that they should be effective. The indicator should be efficient and there should be an impact of the evaluation that is that the program should improve somehow. So these are some of the steps in evaluation. So now if you understand this, this question was easy looking. In fact, it was a difficult MCQ, I would say that the evaluation is based on treatment, evaluation based on treatment and clinical measurements of the patient in a healthcare facility, evaluation of how you treat, or what are the diagnostic things you do, what are the clinical management skills you have, and uh, we are going to evaluate a nurse on how she manages a patient who is to be put on ventilator, that would be evaluation of the process and not a, or not outcome measurement, right? So that it's a pretty simple answer over here. Answer is the best answer over here is a process evaluation. So now let us come to the next topic we about the miscellaneous questions and questions from medical research. This MCQ was uh, like uh, quite a debatable MCQ. We had a lot of discussions on different platforms on social media groups on uh, Facebook and on Telegram. So let me just read out this MCQ for you. A researcher wants to know whether there is an association of the CRP values with the risk of MI. That's what the final objective of the, of the study is. The study group was divided into quintiles and the following table is formed based on the study results. Which of the following statement is true regarding the relationship between CRP and MI? So we not talk about the quintiles, that's fine. The data, the study group had been divided into quintiles. <clears throat> Now we are going to focus on two things, the CRP values and the relative risk. If the CRP value beta is less than one, the relative risk is one. The relative risk is how much it is one. Okay. What do you mean by the relative risk? What, what is a relative risk? See, if a relative risk is less than one, that means it is a protective factor. If it is equal to one, that means there is no association. We are not talking of correlation. There is no association. If the relative risk is more than one, there is a positive association. Done. So now in low CRP values, so now in low CRP values, low CRP values, there is no association. As the CRP values increase, as the CRP values, CRP values, as they increase, the relative risk also increases. That means there is a very strong association of getting MI at higher risk, higher CRP values. At low CRP values, you may get MI, you may not get MI, we don't know. But at higher risk, higher CRP values, the risk of MI definitely increases. Are you understanding? This is what the take home message of this whole understanding is. See, at lower CRP values, you will get MI, you will not get MI, irrespective of that, there is no association. You may get 50% chance of getting MI, 50% not getting MI. It does not say it is protective. But if the CRP value is high, it is more than 4. If the CRP value is more than 4 to 5, whatever number it was, right? If the CRP value is more, 
Then the risk of getting MI is there. That is the relative risk is positive. That means that the positive association, there is a strong association between MI and CRP values. So that means as the CRP increases, the risk of MI also increases common sense so let's just read the options the crp has no association with mi this is a wrong answer false answer increase in crp increases the risk this is yes increase in crp decreases the risk absolutely wrong answer in one quintile there is no in quintile one there is no risk of mi this is plus or minus i don't know whether this option was there even if it was there option number b Option number B is the best answer to mark over here because it is a straightforward answer. Option D, I would not like to mark, I would not like to give it a better mark than option number B because in quintile 1 there is no risk of MI. I don't know about the risk of MI. There is a 50% chance. At least the CRP is not associated with MI. This is what it means. So this is how you need to approach this MCQ. It is a direct answer. It is easy looking MCQ. But the option number B is the best answer over here. Next is a child learning the steps of hand washing and then trying to show it at home that how do we do hand washing or whatever the MCQ was. So what do you think it is? Is it a cognitive effect? It is. Is it a cognitive uh, learning? Effective learning, psychomotor or cognitive and effective both. So a child learning the steps of hand washing. There are two, three types of learning. You can either have a cognitive learning or you can have an affective learning or you can have a psychomotor learning. Cognitive learning is what is knowledge. You read it and you learn it. You know about cognitive learning because you have heard about cognitive learning from me or from anyone right with due, due respect to everyone so let us say that you learn things you know how 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 the sickle cell anemia is diagnosed you know how to treat tuberculosis you know how to treat uh, myocardial infarction or or do the clinical management of myocardial infarction because you have the cognition you have the knowledge of doing that then there is emotional learning or there is a attitudinal change or there is a learning by by feelings that is what is affective learning so once you feel bad you already know that you do this if you're feeling bad about if you might have that gut feeling so that is what is affective learning where you learn based on your attitudes if you uh, see something wrong you tend to do something for that that is all based on your feelings or your inner things so that is affective learning and then you have a psychomotor learning which is the skill based learning skill based learning these are psychomotor learning and this is what is the mcq was you learning the steps of hand washing there's not about cognition it's not about knowledge it's not about your feeling it is about the learning the skills about that you have to do like this then you have to do like this then you have to do like this and then there is this there are steps and there are eight steps of hand washing you must have learned in your surgery department from our very learned uh, dr rohan sir so you know about the steps of hand washing right so you know about the steps of hand washing because that is knowledge based that is cognition i understand but more than cognition is what is this a psychomotor skill it is a skill based thing so the best answer i would like to mark over here is psychomotor learning so this is a psychomotor learning skill. There are theories of based of learning, like how do you learn things? You do learning by observation. You do th uh, learning by doing things, like that is what is uh, your practical classes. Inborn condition reflexes, memorizing your ratification things, demonstrations, that is what we do in our practical classes. We demonstrate that that's how you're supposed to do. And then there is your personal experiences. These are all your theories of learning. What are the factors which would affect learning? The factors which would affect the foremost, the main factor which would affect your learning is how much is the need of learning. What is your level of motivation? Do you really want to learn it? That is one of the most important determining factor. Then there is age. There is a certain age beyond which learning kind of becomes uh, tricky stuff but of course there are many people I know who have surpassed that age criteria but one of the most important factors for learning is motivation then is your basic intelligence or your basic level of intelligence your mental health your physical health and then there is mode of learning whether you're learning online you're learning offline you're learning on a mobile tablet on you're learning on a Samsung tablet you're learning on an iPad you're learning on a iPhone you're learning on a Samsung phone you're learning on some other phone 
so uh, uh, whether you're learning with a good audio visual thing so all these would affect your learning right but the most important is one the motivation motivation is one of the main factors for learning so anyways coming back to the mcq a child learning the steps of hand washing and then showing back to his parents or coming back to the family uh, what is the skill this is a psychomotor skill that people would be learning so now let us talk about the last topic communicable diseases i duly understand that you must have read so much about them and learned so much about them from our worthy faculties from clinical subjects from uh, gynecology from pediatrics from microbiology and uh, just for the sake of completeness i'm going to discuss the communicable disease uh, mcqs over here but uh, the first mcq is a pregnant female pregnant female whose niece lives with her in the same house contracted varicella somehow she turned a negative for serum antibodies against varicella what would this mean probably we are talking of the pregnant female who had no antibodies common sense if there are no antibodies that means what that the female is susceptible she is susceptible to what she is susceptible to either zoster or to chickenpox zoster is what it is a reactivation of the latent chickenpox viruses or the varicella virus so it is not zoster answer is probable answer is she is susceptible to chickenpox a few things about chickenpox in pregnancy so if the female contracts chickenpox or varicella infection during pregnancy within 20 weeks there is 0.4 to 2% chance of developing a congenital varicella syndrome so the congenital varicella syndrome is characterized by cutaneous scars which are not at all good looking no like they are not so good looking cutaneous scars atrophy of the limbs micrognathia microcephaly and microphthalmia then there is deafness chorioretinitis cerebrocortical atrophy these all are typical features of congenital varicella syndrome which is which has higher chances of happening if the mother was pregnant and got uh, varicella during uh, during her early pregnancy even if the baby does not develop congenital varicella infection the infants who are born infants who are born who are exposed to varicella that means the mother had a varicella infection during pregnancy the infant born was normal they are at definitely higher risk of developing herpes zoster herpes zoster they are definitely higher risk of developing herpes zoster within 1 year of life you should also note that in case if the mother was uh, if the mother if the mother had varicella within 5 days of delivery if the mother had varicella or has varicella within 5 days of delivery the child is a very high chance there is very high chance of having disseminated disseminated varicella infection in child so therefore there should be a prophylactic prophylactic varicella zoster immunoglobulin which is should be given to the child so i have told you about two three situations if the mother gets pregnant and if the female gets pregnant and she gets varicella there is higher chance of herpes zoster in the baby there is higher chance of congenital varicella syndrome and if the mother gets a uh, chickenpox during or immediately after delivery then there is disseminated uh, varicella infection chances and the child should be given varicella immunoglobulin talking of this varicella immunoglobulin uh, few things about let's discuss about few things about varicella immunoglobulin also this varicella immunoglobulin should be mcq should be given within 72 hours of exposure it is given at the rate of 12.5 international units per kilogram which should not be more than 625 units in a single time or in a single dose 12.5 units per kilogram this is usually given in two doses 3 weeks apart it is usually given in two doses it is given as intramuscular injection 3 weeks apart two doses it is never combined not combined do not combine with varicella with varicella vaccine because it renders the immunoglobulin the vaccine will render the immunoglobulin as non efficacious or non effective so this is about the varicella immunoglobulin given as 3 weeks apart two doses talking about the varicella uh, vaccine varicella vaccine 
द वैरिसेला वैक्सीन इज ओके ए स्ट्रेन इट इज गिवन एज जीरो पॉइंट फाइव एम एल सब क्यूटेनियस इंजेक्शन सब क्यूटेनियस इंजेक्शन इट इज ऑल्सो गिवन एज टू डोजेस दिस टू डोजेस इज इट कुड बी गिवन टू वन ईयर टिल ट्वेल्व ईयर्स ऑफ चाइल्ड सो इन वन ईयर टू ट्वेल्व ईयर ऑफ चाइल्ड द टू डोजेस शुड हैव अ गैप ऑफ थ्री मंथस मिनिमम थ्री मंथस मोर देन थ्री मंथस and if it is more than 13 years age group child then we can have 4 to 6 weeks gap the varicella vaccine should not be combined with zoster vaccine uh, with the zoster immunoglobulin i'm telling you again varicella vaccine can also be given as post exposure prophylaxis up till 5 days within 5 days of exposure varicella vaccine can also be given of course immunoglobulin is a much more advanced form of uh, of the vaccine because it will uh, have the immediate effect right now so varicella immunoglobulin is specifically given for uh, conditions where there is a known varicella exposure in people who have uh, immunocompromised status who have leukemias who are on chemotherapy or immunosuppressed and or pregnant so in those cases we can give this varicella zoster immunoglobulin so this was your mcq and the the best right option over here would be she is susceptible to chicken pox let's move to the next mcq a male presented with urethral discharge as shown in the image so it's a white color discharge what do you think it is is it a whitish discharge that is candidiasis is it genital urea plasma is it hemophilus ducreae infection or gonorrhea infection i think most of you must have answered it right it is a gonorrhea infection so whenever there is a urethral discharge in male whenever there is urethral discharge in male it is assumed that there is a concomitant chlamydia infection also so you always have to treat gonorrhea along with chlamydia infection this treatment has to go on for a period of 7 to 14 days and then you assess you bring the patient you ask the patient to come back for follow up and then you assess in case the patient shows signs of improvement you just keep on following up in case the patient does not show sign of treatment uh, improvement then they have to be uh, something else we treat for uh, advanced uh, condition like trichomonas vaginalis vaginalis or something so one thing for sure uh, one thing you have to understand is whenever we get a case of gonorrhea we have to treat for both gonorrhea and chlamydia the second thing is you also have to do partner treatment so the partner treatment notification and the treatment of partner has is mandatory whenever we get gonorrhea or chlamydia both or single single also so there has to be dual infection dual treatment we give cefex 400 mg plus azithromycin 1 g as single dose and return after 7 days in case the symptom persist or there is no signs of improvement secnidazole 2 g oral single dose for trichomonas vaginalis can be tried talking about the other options like hemophilus ducreae infection or uh, or the genital lesions broadly speaking any genital lesion in a primary health center in a opd based setting can broadly be classified whether the whether the genital lesion is elevated or is it depressed if it is elevated it is more so pointing towards cancer some some uh, some uh, proliferative disease or it could be inflammatory disease or autoimmune disease that is what the general understanding is it could be malignant it could be inflammatory it could be autoimmune so what do we mean by inflammatory that is lichen planus it could be psoriasis it could be non infectious causes like squamous cell carcinomas or melanoma it could be infectious causes also like the the inflammatory causes or the infectious causes like molluscum contagiosum secondary syphilis or reiter syndromes or herpes simplex which of course would be vesicles so these are all uh, answers for the elevated genital lesions in case of the lesions which are depressed now you as a clinician you have to decide whether the lesion is painful or non painful in case it is itchy it is with itching it is with excoriation direct answer is pubic lice or some uh, infestation or scabies has occurred right that's simple that's separate but now you have to decide whether it is a painless lesion or it is a painful lesion and that is what the maximum mcqs are asked in this area so if the lesions are painless 
painless there are only three situations that is primary syphilis that is there was a chancre or there is granuloma inguinale or there is lgv that is lymphogranuloma venero so i have divided the all lesions into two categories you can have painful lesions or you can have non painful or painless lesions the painful lesions could be either chancroid the painful lesions could be chancroid that is hemophilus ducre or there could be genital herpes that is hsv1 and 2 and in case of syphilis granuloma inguinale or lymphogranuloma venerum these are all examples of pain less genital lesions so in this there is a predominant urethral discharge what is the best answer to mark over here the best answer to mark over here is a gonorrhea infection it is a direct answer direct question gonorrhea infection next mcq <clears throat> A child presents with bluish white spots in mouth, which is followed by a maculopapular rash over the body. What is the genome? It's a pure, typical microbiology-based MCQ. But uh, the point, uh, the pointers over here is that there are white spots in the mouth. They would have told that it is in the buccal cavity, in the buccal side, or near the molars or the premolars. Then you would have directly jumped on, and we would have said there was fever and rash also. You would have jumped on the answer as measles, right? So it is basically measles and the rash there talking in the mouth is coplic spots coplic spots are small bluish white spots which are there in the buccal mucosa and they come uh, around two to three days before the onset of the rash and the fever so it is typically asking they are talking about a measles virus measles virus is a rna paramyxovirus which is an enveloped single-stranded rna there is single serotype of the measles and that's the reason that we are jumping around and saying that probably measles can be eliminated or eradicated because there is single serotype. We have effective vaccine and there is no carrier stage for measles. However, please note that there are some cases which are subclinical or they are latent. They might occur after some time, but they do occur. There is no carrier stage in measles. No people are there like chronic carriers of measles. It does not happen. The measles is communicable before and after rashes, four days before and five four days after the onset of rash and that's the reason that once a child gets rash we are supposed to isolate the child for six to seven days the book says still seven days they should be isolated so that you cover the maximum amount of the communicable period for that particular child so epidemics are usually tend to occur in uh, in the early months of the year january to april and the best public health measure is to give measles vaccine with more than 95 percent coverage in the area with vitamin a prophylaxis talking a little bit about the measles vaccine i think we all know it is a live vaccine it is given as 0.5 ml subcutaneous vaccine subcutaneous vaccine the strain of the vaccine is edmonston zagreb strain at most in Zagreb, this 0.5 ml of the vaccine will contain more than 1000 infective units of the measles virus. It is at most in Zagreb strain live virus vaccine and it has to be reconstituted. Remember M, M, you just inverse it. That is measles is reconstituted with water, which water? Distilled water. So measles vaccine, the M vaccine is reconstituted with the W thing that is the distilled water and uh, this distilled water and the measles vaccine does not fall under the open vial policy. Open vial policy is not applicable to measles vaccine. It has to be used within four to six hours or within the same day of the session of the immunization session. So these are a couple of things about the measles vaccine. So with that, I think we have covered most of the MCQs on uh, on the for the recall session for community medicine in your NEET entrance exam. So mind it that most of the MCQs, they were all easy MCQs with a few exceptions of easy looking MCQs. However, there was no uh, out of the box difficult, like never heard of MCQ. It was not there in this exam. So any still you have any doubts or you want any thing to be added in this video or you feel that these are some of the additions or your um, the feedback for this video is most welcome in the comment box uh, below and uh, you can also contact me on the facebook groups in the marrow links app 
in on my own uh, facebook group or you can contact us through the page instagram website wherever you want so a very warm welcome to this ini cet 2021 recall question discussion for community medicine subject so if you look at this uh, chapter wise distribution of the questions for ini set exam you can see that the examiner had taken not so conventional like they had taken the traditional approach that they asked many mcqs from uh, the main forte topics that is public health healthcare administration and medical research. So you can see that seven, four and four, around 15 questions from the total 20 questions were from these three topics only. If you look deeper into these topics, you can see that again, 15 questions were there from medical research, uh, healthcare and public health. A lot of questions on uh, national health programs and the related communicable diseases. Right. So the resources that I have taken during my session today, uh, I have taken for the question on the non-inferiority trials or the equivalent trials. I've taken uh, a couple of the web based resources, as you can see on the screen. So you're most welcome to look at these resources and study more if you've got time. We also took a couple of resources from the diabetic guidelines for the question on diabetic guidelines and the interesting question on causes of death. So anyways, if you've got time, you look at these resources. Otherwise, let's get on and dive into the understanding of these recall questions. Question number one, which of the following will show equivalence of the new drug? So you had been given this type of image where you had these uh, lines somewhere like left and right, you had these lines and you had to find out like which of the following will show equivalence over here. There are two, three components of this question. First is you should understand that what do we mean by the equivalent studies? That is your first thing you should know. Whether we have superiority studies or comparator drug or the inferiority studies or the zone of equivalency, what do we mean by that? The second is you should understand that what is this? So that will be my question number two and the question number one is regarding the equivalence. Let us talk about what type of clinical trials do we have? Let us say that this is a new drug. Just assume that this is the new drug that which I have invented and there was a standard drug which is already existing in the market. So you have a new drug with the standard drug. So the new drug, let us say that you invented a new drug and there is a standard drug. So there are a couple of options right now. Either you can say that my this new drug is better in terms of the cure, in terms of money, in terms of effect, it is better than the standard drug. That is called as a superiority trials. Or you can say that there are, see, uh, th this was the standard drug. There has to be some of the side effects of the standard drug. Let us say that this was a chemotherapeutic agent. There was weight loss. There was a lot of hair loss. There was a lot of metabolic changes in your body with the standard drug. And now you have invented a new drug, which is not as bad as the standard drug. So that means that this new drug is not, mark the words, it is not inferior to the standard drug. It is not as bad. So you can either say that my new trial is a non-inferiority trial. I want to show that my new drug does not have so many side effects. Or the third thing that you can do is equivalence studies where you can say that the new drug is as good as the standard drug. It is almost same in terms of the effect, in terms of efficacy, effectivity and in terms of adverse or the side effects. So technically speaking, the clinical trials can broadly be classified into superiority trials, non-inferiority trials and equivalence studies. Now, if you understand this, let me show you the same concept in a graphical presentation. You can say on the center point, there is a zone of equivalency. What is this? This is a zone of equivalency. And on the left hand side, on the pure left side, let us say that this point is a minus delta and this is plus delta. What is all this? See, this is the cutoff limit beyond which if I get the result, beyond which if I get the result, that will be termed as the superior uh, drug trial. See, uh, the effect of a drug is a, a, has to be some effect, right? So beyond when will you call the effect as superior, that is termed as the plus delta. Below which will you call this drug as inferior, that is called as minus delta. So this is the inferiority cutoff or the criteria and then you have a superiority criteria and then there is a zone of equivalence that if my drug falls within the zone of equivalence, it will be termed as a equivalent trial, right? So you, do you get this? Now, 
you should also know that what do we mean by confidence limits you should also understand what do we mean by the box and whisker plots see you already know that there is a normal distribution curve in the normal distribution curve there is one standard deviation two standard deviation and three standard deviation the number of data which falls within plus minus one standard deviation is 68 percent plus minus two standard deviation 95 percent and plus minus three standard deviation 99 percent you also know that there is a box and whisker plot in the box and whisker or in the confidence limit we take as the minimum range and we take as the plus range this minimum range is taken as minus two standard deviation the plus is taken as plus two standard deviation so whatever result we are showing it is always showed in terms of the median the center point minus two standard deviation and the plus two standard deviation so this whole thing will correspond to the effect of the drug effect of the drug will not be a single number that is we don't take into account the only average or the median of the result or the mean of the result we take into account the confidence limit how much confidence interval we do we take as the normal effect that is plus minus two standard deviation or the 95 percent so now if i plot this confidence limits on this curve on this graphical presentation chart so you can see that let us say a drug trial was there which shows an effect something like this so what is the effect over here see sometimes it was showing inferior effect sometimes it was showing towards superior effect and mostly it was showing the equivalent effect so what is this drug this trial has shown a equivalent effect we will term that this as equivalent effect let us say a drug trial has shown effect like this what is this that means that it is way beyond the superiority cutoff so what is the answer over here this is a superior effect this drug is superior to the previous drug let us say a drug came out like this this is what we call as inferior drug on the other hand let us say now the complexity start things will always not be black and white you always have grayish in between so uh, let us say a drug comes and shows the effect something like this what is this now this effect this drug is it superior no it is not at all superior is it inferior no it is not inferior is it equivalent kind of equivalent but it is not inferior also so this trial is termed as mark the words it is non-inferior drug it is not inferior but it is not at all superior also so this trial will be called as a non-inferiority trial or the or the results will be non-inferior the new drug is not inferior to the standard drug okay so uh, is it superior no we cannot say that so now if you understand these complexities now you should be able to understand and answer the what is happening to these lines over here let us just zoom into it and let's see what actually is happening what is this about this drug trial number d this is pure equivalent equivalent but what about this drug trial number e and drug trial number c the one side of their tail is falling within the zone of equivalency and one side is beyond the zone of equivalency either on the inferior or the superior side so whenever any tail will fall within the zone of equivalency we will call this result as equivalent result why because it is sometimes showing this c drug it is sometimes showing inferiority sometimes it is towards inferiority sometimes it is equivalent the drug number e it shows sometimes equivalent result and sometimes it is showing a kind of superiority result but we generally term them as equivalent trials coming to these trial number f and g the f and g what do you think are these equivalent no we cannot say that they are equivalent are these superior no we cannot say they are superior also so these drugs are termed as non superior the result of my study will show that these drugs were not superior to the previous drug we will not term about we will not say anything about the equivalency or the inferior but these are non superior trials what about the drug number b and drug number what about the drug number b and drug number a the drug number b and drug number a are these equivalent no are these inferior mark the words now are these inferior no so these are termed as non inferior results 
So that means that drug number A did not show any inferiority. It was not inferior trial. Was it superior? No, it was not superior also. Was it equivalent? No, it was not equivalent also. But what are the terminologies we use over here? These are trials are known as non-inferior. The other side, these are non-superior and then you have the equivalent results. So based on this, if you understand which of the following drugs uh, studies will show equivalence to the new drug, answer is right in front of your answer is C, D and E. So we should mark the option number C, D and E. Let us move to the next MCQ. Refer to the image. Four groups of homogeneous sample were taken and the height and weight of each group were, had correlation coefficient of 0 0.6. The total correlation of the combined group will be. So there are few keywords over here. So one is a homogeneous sample was taken. The height and weight of each group had a correlation coefficient of 0 0.6. So this is the image they had shown. This is just a replica try to make a replica of the image. So these were four groups. You had group A, B, C and D with different colors. So this question is saying that it was a homogeneous sample and the total correlation coefficient was 0 0.6 like of each group. So if the each group had 0 0.6, 0 0.6 and 0 0.6, what is the combined correlation? Combined is simple average. Combined a simple average. This is a very old uh, uh, study uh, article which was published in the in the Psychonomic uh, Society Bulletin by WHO. In this, we had a note on combining of the correlations. You can see that this article also says that the averaging methods are appropriate when several different samples are independently drawn from the same population or the homogeneous population and the interest is in aggregating those values. In case the population below this paragraph you can read again that in case the population was not homogeneous or it was heterogeneous or from different segments of the population then we cannot use co correlation aggregation otherwise it is simple average. So what is the best answer over here? The best answer is the combined effect uh, combined correlation of the total would be equal to 0 0.6. It is a direct MCQ only thing is they just uh, try to twist the language and try to make the question a little more interesting and difficult. Let us see question number three. Next MCQ, which of the following statement is true? This is one of the favorite questions from most of the students. Uh, you would be happy to answer this, I know. So what do you think is the answer? The PPV increases with increasing prevalence. Sensitivity depends on the prevalence. The specificity would depend on the prevalence. In low prevalence, positive of a high sensitivity means true positive. So what do you think is true? You already know that this is the box that we always talk of. You have disease on one side, D plus, and then you have the disease negative. Then you have the T plus and you have the T minus. This is the true positive, the true negative, and then you have the bad ones, the false positive and the false negative. You already know that what do we mean by sensitivity? Sensitivity is nothing but true positive divided by the total D plus. You already know that what is specificity? That is true negatives divided by the total D plus. You already know that what is the positive predictive value that is true positive divided by the total tested positive. If you understand this, now what is prevalence? Prevalence means the total number of people having the disease. So if you talk about the prevalence, let us take a new page. If you talk about the prevalence, what is the prevalence D plus and D minus? The prevalence will be denoted by which aspect? The prevalence is denoted by how many people are having the disease. So the prevalence is going to determine what it is going to determine whether it is going to determine the sensitivity specificity or whether it is going to determine the positive predictive value that was a simple basic question which the AIMS people the INI set people have been asking since the last 10-20 uh, years since the time I was giving my entrance exam at that time also we had similar question that PPV depends on prevalence yes or no you are supposed to answer that you should be knowing this simple question prevalence please remember is going to depend on the PPV or the PPV technically depends on the prevalence. The sensitivity is what? Sensitivity is nothing but true positive divided by the D plus. So if the prevalence increases, let us say that the prevalence increases, the sensitivity will remain the same. The specificity will remain the same. What is going to change? The PPV is going to change. Are you getting it? If the table moves left and right, the positive predictive value changes. I think we had had a lot of discussion on this.
So beta in this, this is a direct question, direct answer that the PPV increases with increase in the prevalence. Sensitivity will depend on the prevalence? No. Specificity will depend on the prevalence? No. In low prevalence, positive of highly sensitivity means true positive that is again false because uh, uh, high sensitivity uh, does not mean like true positive or false positive. It technically means uh, high sensitivity definitely means that the true positive is more out of the disease population. Total disease, true positive is more. That is what is uh, sensitivity. It has nothing to do with prevalence, right? So what is the best answer over here? Which of the following statement is true? Answer is PPV increase with increase in the prevalence. Next MCQ, the graphical presentation of flow cytometry analysis done by which of the following bar and dot plot, histogram dot plot, line diagram dot plot, pie chart dot plot. So one thing is for sure that this MCQ taught you that the uh, uh, these uh, flow cytometry charts, these are dot plot charts. You have to decide whether it is a bar, a histogram, a line chart or a pie chart. Definitely, I think most of us know it is not a pie chart. I think you all must have seen a histogram. You must have seen a histogram. What is this? This is a histogram. So you have these results over here, which will be shown as scatter diagrams or you can have these line diagrams over here. Okay. So this scatter is what is a dot and plot or a dot and blot. And these are what are dot plot charts. So the scatter or dot plot is what is definitely there. What is happening over here? What are these charts? Are these bar diagrams? Are these pie charts? Are these line diagrams? Are these histograms? You have to decide. It is not a line diagram. It is not a line diagram because technically we say line diagram is always associated with time on one axis you will have time. So this does not have time. It has the how much uh, fluorescence uh, intensity is there, how much light intensity is there on a flow cytometer that is what is there on the on the horizontal axis. So it is not associated with time. It is not a line diagram. It is not a pie chart and it is not a bar chart why because bar chart tells you what it tells you about the qualitative data whereas this is a running data so technical answer best answer would be here to mark is that you should be marking a histogram and a dot plot see it is not a bar because it was not a qualitative data it is not a line diagram because there was no element of time pie chart i think we all know pie chart is something which is circular and then you have sections based in the circle that is a pie chart so it is not a pie chart so easy question easy answer let's move on and take the next mcq next mcq topic healthcare and administration i always say during my lectures during my sessions that everybody we should all work in the hospital one is it will give us a lot of clinical exposure second it also helps us in doing the self learning or the observation based learning that how what are the small nuances that how the hospital actually functions or uh, what is the level of administration of a hospital or a healthcare facility. So moving to this interesting MCQ. A lot of students had uh, so many doubts on this that how to solve this kind of new question. Let us see how to solve this easy MCQ. At a PHC, 50 patients were transferred from another center and required the antihypertensive treatment. Simple. So 40 people were given amlodipine, which is a traditional drug in PHC. 10 people had contraindication to amlodipine, so we gave them lisinopril. So total how many people? 50 people, right? 40 for amlo and 10 for lisino. That's interesting and important. The keyword is the drugs are supplied at the PHC on monthly basis. How many medications are you going to order extra with the reorder factor to maintain the stocks and provide healthcare to the community? Options were 1000, 1200, 1400, 1600 and so on. So simple question. This question is testing your inventory control or inventory uh, management uh, uh, skills. So beta, whenever we are placing an order, you should note that whenever we are placing an order, there always is a lead time. There is always a lead time associated with the order. What do you mean by the lead time? Lead time? Lead time is nothing but the difference, the time between the order placed and before you procure the drugs. So after this lead time, again you get the drugs, again you consume the drugs, again the drugs, uh, the quantity will fall, again you place the order, there is a lead time and again you get the drugs. Simple. So the lead time is a very important key player over here. Uh, depend, it tells you that how many drugs are you going to order. This lead time is what is related to the reorder factor. That is what I want you to understand. So what this question, so one was this concept of lead time, right? So now coming back to the question, this question 
was asking you what it was asking you that tell me how many medications should i order so the beta the reorder level that is given by how much is your monthly consumption plus monthly consumption plus a safe limit how much is this safe limit that how much medication sh you should always have in your safety stock multiplied with the reorder factor okay so let us first see what is the reorder factor it, it depends on the lead time right now we talked if the drugs are getting on monthly basis if the you are getting the drugs on in a health facility depends on what level you are talking right so if the drugs is given to the phc or the chc on monthly basis the reorder factor is taken as 2 if it is given on bi monthly not bi monthly like it if it is given on two monthly basis if it is on two monthly basis the basis the reorder factor is taken as 4 if it is on three monthly basis the reorder factor is taken as 6 one thing is for sure that the reorder factor is 2 over here why because it is on monthly basis so either you're going to mark option b or option d i'm not saying that these were the same option in your exam these are the, the, i'm just trying to tell you the topic right so the reorder factor is turned down over here it is answer is 2 what is the monthly consumption and what is the safe limit please note let us calculate the monthly consumption you already know that there were 40 people with amlodipine and I think uh, 10 people for lisinopril. So total how many people were there? 50 people. So this 40 and 10, 50 people multiplied by 30, that is the number of days in the month. So number of days in the month, that is 1500. This is my average monthly consumption. So what should be my safe limit? the safe limit usually we keep the safe limit it depends on the reorder factor it depends on the lead time it also depends the safe limit also depends on the expiry of the medicine usually generally if nothing is specified the safe limit we keep it for two days it should be there with you that is what is the safety stock in the inventory control also there is a safety stock that below which the number should never fall right you should always order at a point way more than the safety stock right so the safety limit is usually kept for two days so the safe limit over here we are going to calculate the safe limit so you were going to take 50 for uh, every day so 50 into 2 that is 100 so what is the best answer over here that is 1600 multiplied with the reorder factor with the reorder factor of 2 so that is your best answer simple question simple answer which is your best answer option number d you're going with 1600 and reorder factor of 2 let us take the next question, which is, of course, a question from pharmacology. You must have discussed with uh, our esteemed faculty from pharmacology, Dr. Ranjan, sir, which of the following is not included in the criteria for an essential drug. So the essential drug under the national uh, uh, program for essential availability of the essential drugs, we have a lot of programs for availability of the essential drugs. Uh, the guidelines are that the drug which is essential should be approved in India. Of course, that is common sense. It should be useful for a disease which is public health problem in India. Proven efficacy, cost effective, aligned with the current treatment guidelines. It should have good storage, available storage capacities. The price of the total treatment should not be uh, uh, a hindrance to the government. Next is the fixed dose, uh, fixed dose combinations are generally not included under the essential drugs because they, they kind of because the fixed dose combinations they don't uh, work with the weight based guidelines with the age based guidelines so the age based criteria is different dosage is different so fixed dose are generally not recommended under the essential drug list right so all the essential drug list they should be available at the primary secondary and the tertiary level so based on this if you understand this what is the best answer over here let us start from below so the clinical trials must be proven with efficacy it should be there for the uh, for the uh, essential drug list the drug should be cost effective definitely this is true should be in line with the treatment guidelines this is also true for a public health problem in india fixed dose combination is better than fixed dose combination is better than the individual drug this is false so that is the question you that is the option you're going to mark in this mcq now so it was easy question right so now moving to the next mcq which of the following is are true for mobile medical units 
MMUs that is mobile medical units, they are government operated, they are run by external agencies with medical supplies by the government, they are run by the government and medical supplies by the government, they are run by external and uh, supplies also by external, which of the following do you think are true? So talking about the mobile medical units, this was a program which was uh, planned somewhere in with NRHM 2005-06 only, but it was implemented very lately 2015-16 uh, across the country. So the operational models for uh, med mobile medical units is that they can be run by the government of India. The MMU can also be outsourced. The outsource operations of the MMU on outsourcing, the CAPEX and the drugs are supplied by the government. What is CAPEX? CAPEX stands for the CAPEX. It stands for the capital expenditure. Capital expenditure and OPEX. It stands for the operational expenditure. So, capital expenditure includes like the infrastructure, the hospital, buildings, the, the beds, the uh, maybe the OT tables, the equipments which are used. The operational expenses would be like day-to-day -day expenses, the staffing expense, the transport expense, the rental uh, expense, the electricity expense, that is operational expenses. So, plan B could be operations of the mobile medical units on outsourcing where the capex that is the capital expenditure and the drugs and supplies will be provided by the government but the operational expenditure by the outsourcing agencies. Third plan could be outsourcing of the MMU including the capex and the opex by the outsourcing agencies. However, the drugs and uh, the supplies will be supplied by the government of India only. So these are different models of the mobile medical units. I think now you can uh, easily answer it. Mobile medical units are government operated. That is true. So this is true. Mobile units are can be run by the external agencies with supplies given by the government of India. That is also true. Mobile units can be run by government and medical supplies also by government. That is of course true. Mobile units can be run by external agencies and the supply by external agencies that is not true. This is the false option. So which of the following are true? Which are you going to mark? We are going to mark option number A, B and C because the question was which of the following is true. So you are going to mark option A, B and C all three as correct answers. So let us take the next question. As per the verbal autopsy report of 2010 to 2013 arranged the causes of death in one to four year old child. So I'm not so much convinced with the question. I think there could be an error. But anyways, that was the recall which we had all got from uh, the students. So the question had asked about 2010 to 2013. So that's like the I don't know why the examiner had asked about the uh, report, which was a decade 10 years old data. So the options were diarrhea, pneumonia, malaria, injury, we might spend a few minutes over here extra minutes to make you understand what is happening where. So, beta, whenever we are talking of causes of death, the cause of death reports can be either by the civil registration system, that is the CRS, or we can have the SRS, that is the sample registration system, that uh, CRS is the birth and death registration, right, civil registration system, SRS is the sample registration system, or else we can also have some independent surveys. This one of the biggest independent survey, I think I had also been a part of this survey that is a million death study, MDS, million death study. So the, this was a big study where they had to study the causes of death in pregnant mothers and they had to stud, uh, study the causes of death in children, one to four year old child, under five child as we can say. So the, the key highlight over here is that as per the verbal autopsy, verbal autopsy was taken under this million death study. It was a module which was adopted under this million death study. So the million death study was conducted by the Center of Global Health and Research CGHR. So the CGHR people, CGHR people, Central, uh, Center for Global Health Research. So the CGHR people gave this causes of death of in, in India year 2010 to 2013. And I think this was the source of MCQ for this uh, question. So if you look at this table from the source of, for the cause of death, you can find out like uh, for more information, you can visit this link also. The causes of death, you can see that the highest number was for pneumonias then for diarrheas and then for injuries and then for malaria. So simple question, simple answer, direct question, direct answer, what are you going to mark? The causes of death were highest for pneumonia, then for diarrhea, then for injuries and then for pneumonia. So the option would be, first would be option B that is pneumonia, followed by diarrhea that is option number A, 
followed by injuries that is option number d and followed by malaria that is option number c this was the best answer right so uh, what are you going to mark over here you are going to put this as the sequence but i have concerns over this if you get this question very nice again but there are chances you might get the question on the medical certification of cause of death year 2019 which is the latest data so i just want to share with you the latest srs or the crs data by the ministry of health and family welfare which is the latest data 2019 as per this data the highest causes of death is because of septicemia the change uh, the answer will change now the uh, because of uh, infectious causes out of which maximum was taken by septicemia 11.5 percent next in line we have is the respiratory diseases respiratory diseases which accounts for 16.5 percent of the total deaths out of which of course pneumonia is the major key player then you have surprisingly then you do not have any malaria or any other thing you have the circulatory system disorders that is the cardiac diseases and then you have other neurological or other manifestations or congenital malformations so on and so forth so if you are getting a question please note that septicemia is pretty important in india compared to pneumonias and compared to diarrheas also right so please note that septicemia is 11.4 diarrhea is only 1.9 Malaria is only 0.4% of the total, whereas pneumonia is 8.2. So first you would grade it as septicemia followed by pneumonia, followed by a lot of difference between pneumonia and diarrhea. You can see that 8.2 and 1.9. Right? So first is septicemia followed by pneumonia, followed by diarrhea and then you have malaria and other things. So this was regarding the medical causes of death for year 2019 so this is what i have shared with you is 2019 crs data so please note that there is a difference in the answers over here right i would also like to point out over here that uh, in your latest textbook of park this is the park i have taken a snapshot from the park textbook latest 26th edition the 26th edition which was released in 2021 the table number 28 in page 657 it tells you that the leading cause of death in the developing countries and leading cause of death in the developed countries. If you look at the resource that they had taken, the source, the reference that they had taken, this is from the sample registration system year 2016. So this is also old data. So the PARC 26th edition, I'm sorry to say that you cannot follow the report result from PARC 26th edition because they are taking the 2016 data. You are supposed to follow the data which is latest 2019 data. I don't know why the AIMS people had asked you this question about the mid, uh, million uh, death survey about the Center for Global Health Research that is uh, the cause of death based on verbal autopsy. However, this was the answer in that particular question. So now moving over to the broad next topic about public health. Let us look at the questions. They were easy questions and uh, very straightforward questions. Let us take this first question in the chapter of public health. How do you identify a diabetic case in PHC in peripheral setting? Multiple choice questions. Of course, more than one question probably were correct. We don't know. So this question has been dealt again in medicine lectures but talking to you about community medicine perspective because this question had this uh, important keyword of under the peripheral setting how you going to diagnose or find a case of diabetic. So beta in the peripheral center you might be working at a sub center or you might be working at a PHC or a CHC in a rural area. So if you are working in a PHC CHC that means you are a medical officer or a doctor. You know? If you are working at a sub center, you are either an ANM, auxiliary nurse midwife, or you are an MPW. Of course, this question had asked you about the medical officer. How are they going to diagnose this PHC at a diabetes at PHC? Why did I tell you this? I am telling you this because next year the, again the MCQ can be like, how do you screen for diabetes at a sub center level? Okay, so this question had been taken directly from the MPW guidelines published in year 2016-17 for MPWs how to diagnose and how to find the cases of, of diabetes or uh, hypertension and so on for all the non-communicable and communicable disease. Talking about diabetes per se, please note that the guidelines directly had said that random blood glucose is taken as the best method for screening 
along with the fasting blood glucose. But random blood glucose is the main method for screening. Random blood glucose over 140 mg DL is taken as the criteria and requires further follow-up. So that means if you're working at a sub-center level, then how are you going to screen for diabetes beta? You're going to screen for diabetes using the random blood glucose level. More than 140 is taken as diabetic and you need to send that person for follow-up. Now the question had technically asked you about the PHC about the medical officer. So this question had been taken for from the training module of medical officers for prevention and control of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers and, uh, and hypertension published in year 2017 that is the latest we have till now so according to this the criteria for diagnosing of type 2 diabetes is either using a fasting blood glucose or using a two hour post glucose load right so two hour post glucose load using 75 grams of uh, of glucose then we are going to assess this patient so fasting glucose and two hour post glucose this is main cutoff criteria it tells you about the cutoff criteria for diagnosis of of diabetes at a phc or a medical officer level the links are also shared below you can uh, go and uh, have a look at these links also and uh, learn something more in that so what is the best answer over here beta you're going to mark two answers fasting plasma glucose and two hour post glucose load option c and option d are the best answers to be marked over here Let's move to the next MCQ, safe strategy in trachoma. Easy question, easy answer, of course, discussed with ophthalmology also. So uh, there's no, no, no rocket science in this. For trachoma, I think we all should know that we use a safe strategy. S stands for surgeries. A stands for antibiotics. F stands for facial cleanliness. And E stands for environmental hygiene. E stands for environmental hygiene or environmental sanitation that you should have the clean, clean environment for prevention and control of trachoma. So which of the following uh, is not included? Answer number D. Let us move to the next MCQ. Which of the following is associated with intersusception? So they had given a lot of uh, vaccines over here. Rotavirus is the vaccine. We have discussed this in all our lectures that rotavirus is the vaccine which is associated with intersusception as well. Influenza vaccine is associated. It has been seen in some of the cases for gulen barren syndrome. Pentavalent vaccine, it has the pertussis component. So it may be associated with some neurological, um, neurological problems. Oral polio vaccine, it is a live vaccine. It does not have any contraindication per se, but it may land up, the person may land up into a vaccine derived polio virus or a vaccine associated paralytic polio. These are the side effects of the polio vaccines, right? So pentavalent is neurological problems per pertussis, basically belonging to the pertussis vaccine. Influenza is GBS and rotavirus is intersusception. Please note that the, the contraindication for giving a rotavirus is any gastric surgeries of the child before, any already previous past history of uh, maybe small intestine obstructions or ileus or intersusception, previous history. So uh, but it has been seen that uh, intersusception is slightly more linked to the rotavirus vaccine. Coming to the next MCQ, I don't even want to talk on this MCQ. This is such a simple MCQ, beta. Pentavalent contains what? Pentavalent contains DPT, Hep B and H influenza. DPT stands for diphtheria, pertussis and tetanus. I don't think you should get confused. Let us not look at the options and directly mark the answer. Diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, right? H influenza and hepatitis B, this is the correct answer. So now coming to the next MCQ, in case of HIV TB co-infection, how are you going to treat the patient? I know you must have discussed this in medicine lectures with Dr. Rakesh sir also. I have also had a lot of discussion on the same MCQ that whenever there is HIV and TB co-infection, which of course can exist many times, how are you going to treat the patient? Please note that we always start with ATT first. ATT stands for anti-tubercular therapy. ATT is always started first. Why do you start ATT first? Because we are scared of severe immune reconstitution syndrome. We are also scared because the TB is more infectious. TB is more infectious. So because TB is more infectious, you're scared of reactivating the TB in case you start ART. So there might be the patient might land up into, into uh, immune reconstitution syndrome or there might be reactivation of the TB. Therefore, you always want to finish the TB first. So finish the TB first, finish the TB first. You start with ATT uh, for two weeks. 
And after two weeks of therapy with the ATT, when we presume that the patient becomes almost non-infectious, the tuberculosis cam component is kind of decreased. Now you can start the patient on antiretroviral therapy. So first start with ATT and then you continue for two weeks and then you start with antiretroviral therapy. So what are you going to do? You are going to start ATT followed by ART after two weeks. This is the best answer over here, right? So of course, this is an overlap from medicine, but anyways. Next MCQ, the objectives of kangaroo mother care. Again, this question is overlap from pediatrics. I think we all know about the key MC, about the kangaroo mother care. The kangaroo mother care is just sticking the baby close to your body so that there is skin to skin contact. It helps promote emotional bonding and so on. This question had been directly taken from the WHO report on kangaroo mother care about the guidelines on kangaroo mother care. So kangaroo mother care, it involves three components. This guideline directly says it involves three components. It involves early and continuous prolonged skin to skin contact between the mother and the baby. Second is there it promotes frequent and exclusive breastfeeding because the baby is close to the mother. The mother there is more uh, chances of doing exclusive breastfeeding and frequent bre breastfeeding and it also prevents an early discharge from the hospital. So if you talk about the options now, so it helps in promoting skin to skin contact, reduce infection. Is it a component? It is, it of course will reduce infection because you're doing exclusive breastfeeding. But is it a direct component? Answer is no. Exclusive breastfeeding? Yes. Prevent infection? No. Prevent infection? It is not a main component. Early discharge is there. Emotional bonding is there. Early ambulation, prevent heat loss. That's okay. So, which is the best answer you're going to mark over here? Beta, the best answer you're going to mark over here is option number A. There will be skin to skin contact, early discharge is a component and exclusive breastfeed is again the component. This is the main answer for KMC kangaroo mother care. Next MCQ, of course, there's again an MCQ from gynae which is overlapping with community medicine or maybe community medicine overlapping with gynae, whatever way you want. I always tell in my classes that PSM is a five star branch. You name a branch, medicine, it has PSM. Surgery, it has PSM. Gynae, it has PSM. Pediatrics, it has PSM. Dermatology will have PSM. So I, I, I don't think like uh, any disease that you talk of, preventive aspect has always is always there. So coming back to this question from uh, gynecology or obstetrics, uh, match the following. So there were kits which were given and there was a syndrome. You had to match the kits and the syndrome. Simple question, simple answer. We should remember that there are beta 7 kits. Kit 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So first MCQ is you need to remember the colors of these. So you had the kit 1 which is gray, gray color, then green color, white color, blue, red, yellow and black color. So please note that the kit number one, it is used for urethral discharge. Kit number two is used, it is a green colored kit, it is used for bacterial vaginosis or vaginal discharge. Kit number three, four and five, they all are for genital ulcers. They all are for genital ulcers. Kit number three and four, they are for non-herpetic genital ulcers. Kit five is for herpetic genital ulcers. Kit number five is for herpetic, five you can remember as herpes. 5 for herpetic genital ulcers, kit number 5 for herpetic genital ulcers, kit number 6 is for pelvic inflammatory disease or the, or the lower abdominal pain and kit number 7 is for bubos, inguinal bubos. So please note that uh, this question, this question had been asking direct MCQs. So lower abdominal pain is just now we did lower abdominal pain is with kit number 6. So A goes with 4. Urethral discharge, that is kit number one. So B goes with one. Non-herpetic genital ulcers. You remember non-herpetic genital ulcers. Just now we told that it is both kit number three and four. Kit number three is basically for genital ulcers which are non-herpetic and kit number four is again for non-herpetic but which are allergic to penicillin. So because in kit number three, you are giving penicillin for non-herpetic genital ulcers. Okay, so that's the only difference. But anyways, non-herpetic genital ulcers, there was no kit number four. So the only they had given was kit number three. Kit number four was for what beta? Just recall, say it with me. Kit number four was for, it is for people who are allergic to penicillin. We give them kit number four and who have non-herpetic genital ulcers. So your option number C is with three and option number D will of course one, two, two. Option number D will go with two, I don't know, bacterial vaginosis, kit number two. So this was how you're going to mark the kits. Last topic that is, what is the miscellaneous questions? 
So miscellaneous question, I think community medicine will never be over without a question on biomedical waste. A nurse keeps the bin shown in the image in the wards. Which of the following item will go into the black color bin? We have discussed this so, so, so many times that I want to discuss. I am in love with these type of MCQs now. So beta, which do you think is going to go into the black bin? The black bin is for solid waste management, solid waste management. The red color bin, <clears throat> it is for rubbers, it is for tubes. It is for plastic. The yellow color waste, yellow color waste, it is for all infectious waste which is incineratable. The blue color bin is for glass and orthopedic metallic implants. And the white color bin, it is for shops. Hey na? We have done this. So now let us just put all these wherever they belong to. Contaminated gloves, where are you going to put contaminated gloves? Gloves are what? Rubbers? They will go into what category, beta? They will go into the red category. Gloves will again go into the red category, any type of glove. Soiled linen bed sheet, they will go into the yellow category. So, glove paper cover. So, once you open the cover, that is a general waste. So, the general waste is going to go into the black category. So, what is the best answer over here? Glove paper cover. Next MCQ. Which of the following supplement nutrient is required in higher doses as per the recommendation of a recommended dietary allowance for lactating female? So this question is interesting and it was expected MCQ recommended dietary allowances which was changed in year 2020. So as per the recommended dietary allowances which was changed in year 2020, this is the new update as you can see on the screen. So please note that calcium was given a special significance during this new guidelines so calcium the question the guidelines itself wrote that for lactating female an additional they had specifically mentioned that for lactating female an additional amount of 200 milligram is added to the to the ear that is the estimated average requirement and the recommended dietary allowance of 800 and a total of 1000 has been set as the er uh, for the for the calcium so the RDA is set at 1200 milligram for females who are lactating and for postmenopausal females. So calcium had a special in mention in the recommended dietary allowances. Even if you didn't know this, at least you should know that iron is required more in pregnancy and less in lactation. Common sense. Folic acid is required more in pregnancy and less during lactation. Common sense. Now we are left with vitamin A and calcium. Both vitamin A and calcium are required in excess quantities. So both can be the answer. But this question had a twist that which of the following supplementary nutrition. I asked many students about this. That was the word there supplement nutrition. So if the supplement nutrition is there, vitamin A you do not give any supplement nutrition. So the answer best over here is a calcium. Simple, simple, direct MCQ. So even if you look at this chart, which is the update from the recommended dietary allowance, which is again shared on most of your uh, social media platform, it's there in your Marrow application as well. So you can see that uh, for pregnant females and for lactation, you can see that the energy is more common sense for uh, lactation. And, uh, for pregnancy, it is 350. Lactation, it is 600 and 520. Then carbohydrates are slightly more. That's okay. But the point is that the iron is significantly high in pregnancy and it is significantly lower during lactation. On the same basis, the folic acid is significantly high during pregnancy and significantly lower during lactation. So the point of interest over here is that yes, calcium is required more during lactation and uh, vitamin A is required more during lactation and slightly you can say that iodine is slightly more during lactation. But iodine we do not give any supplement, vitamin A we do not give any supplement. So which is the best answer over here beta? We just close this MCQ, answer is calcium over here. Next MCQ, most common mode of absorption of inorganic lead, there are two keywords over here, inorganic lead in industries in lead poisoning. Hmm? So if the question had said that how do you consume inorganic lead in child? In children, it is usually ingestion. But now the MCQ had asked about industries. In industries, we assume that we are talking of adult. 
In adults, the most common source of industrial lead pollution that is inhalation. Inhalation. So, inhalation is the most common source or the root of uh, lead pollution. So, the best answer you would like to mark over here is lead poisoning via inhalation route, right? So, that is the best answer. Next MCQ, point number C in the following diagram represents. So, there was a natural history of disease, natural course of disease. So, you have the stage of susceptibility. I was susceptible. And then you had the onset of subclinical cases. So, in the subclinical disease, probably then this was A point corresponds to the exposure. B point corresponds to the pathogenesis, onset of the pathogenesis. Then C point, C point corresponds to what? That is the demarcation between the stage of clinical disease and stage of subclinical disease. So, C point will correspond to what? Technically, it will correspond to what? Think and say, say, say to me, it will correspond to the onset of sign and symptoms. Sign and symptoms, right? That is how you differentiate between a subclinical and a clinical and D option will correspond to what? D point will correspond to what? Because the sign and symptom arise, the patient becomes restless and they go to the doctor. This is the point of diagnosis, point of diagnosis. So, A point will be exposure, B point will be pathogenesis, C point will be sign symptom, D point will be point of diagnosis. So, what is the best you would like to mark? They are asking about the point number C. The point number C is sign and symptom, onset of sign and symptoms. Pathogenesis, time of diagnosis, exposure to etiologic agents. So, all these I have shown to you in the diagram as, as, as I have just now discussed with you regarding the natural history of disease or natural course of disease. We had a few more MCQs on COVID-19. So, the question were pertaining to the discharge guidelines, which is discussed during your medicine lectures. Use of steroid in cases of severe COVID-19, probably for children. So, that is discussed during your pediatric lectures. And elective surgeries, I think it has been covered by anesthesia faculty, Dr. Chaitanya sir. So, you already have these COVID-19 guidelines. You already have the COVID-19 modules, which are of course the live modules and they keep on changing all the time. So, with that, I would like to thank you so much for uh, joining this session. I would appreciate to have your feedbacks, anything you want to discuss more, anything changes you would like to have. Thank you so much. Take care and bye-bye.